Welcome to the regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, September 26, 2019. Uh, uh, absent or arriving late tonight are uh, Jane Morgan, who is at a parent night, uh, Jeff Thielman, who is uh, stuck in some traffic, uh, Dr. Bodhi is in Naga Okakyo, Japan, uh, with a delegation. Uh, celebrating our sister city relationship, the 35th anniversary of our sister city relationship. So uh, we have a bit of a light agenda. Um, we'll start with public comment. Is there anyone here for public comment? No. All right. So we'll move right ahead to the overview of school counseling and int introduction of new counselors uh, led by our director of counseling, Sarah Bird. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thanks. We are thrilled to be here. We're representing the counseling department for um, the wonderful Arlington <coughs> Public Schools. And I will just show off my t-shirt from the start because it's intentionally worn. <laughs> Someone want to read it out loud for us? School, not guidance counselor. Oh, yeah. Do you know anything about that? <laughs> no. That's what we're here to share with you. So. Uh, my name is Sarah Bird, and I'm the Director of School Counseling and Social Emotional Learning for Arlington Public Schools. And um, many times throughout the past few years, I've noticed we at this circle, but also many other tables in the district, will talk about guidance counseling, school counseling, social work, psychology, all in these different garbled terms, and not necessarily um, have a shared understanding on what the specifics are. So I thought we would uh, kick off the year with a bit of an introduction on school counselors and what our roles are in the district. When I was certified, and I guarantee you when all three of us were certified in counseling, we all received our licenses in guidance counseling. But over the years, the profession has actually moved away from the historical title of guidance, and they've moved towards something called school counseling. What I've shared with you on the files, and I'm not going to quote them or anything, but there's a beautiful article that was just in the Boston Globe, and it says, my guidance counselor never did that. And it really helps to outline the shift that the profession has seen. Even in Massachusetts, if you have somebody who's certified now, they are now certified as school counselors. There's no longer the terminology of guidance counselor. So we are moving towards that, embracing it, as our national professional organization has done as well. And we're not so much rebranding, but just coming back to be really true to our roots of what it is that we do for kids and for the community. So I encourage you to take a look at that article, take a look at the professional organization and standards. I'll speak more about them in a bit, but I wanted to um, introduce our lead counselor so they could share a little bit more with you about the mission of school counselors. Um, so I'm Kathy Hirsch, and I'm one of two lead counselors at Arlington High School, and I cover the side of social emotional um, wellness and Danielle. And hi, Danielle Rakowski. Um, new this year as the lead counselor for college and career uh, planning, but I've been here for 17 years as a school counselor. And we started on the same day 17 years ago together. Wow. So <laughs> here we are. And we, I can speak for both of us, I think really love and enjoy our job and the opportunity we've had over the years for our department to evolve and grow um, to the adjusting needs of students in the world. Um, so when we this year were charged with rewriting our mission statement and vision, we all met together as a department at the beginning of the school year and broke into small breakout groups, sort of rotated through sharing ideas of what we do and what we think is important to emphasize. Um, and we were coming up with long lists. We, um, we cover a lot of ground with the students, um, transitioning into high school, everything that happens while they're here, and then the next step transition after high school. Um, and after some work, we were able to come up with a mission statement that we felt um, covered that broad range of duties that we, that we perform, and also a vision that was very brief that we think really says it all, whole student, all students. So our emphasis is working with each student, meeting them where they are, identifying their individual needs, goals, and helping to support their growth in all areas throughout high school um, as a whole student before they enter the world. 
And um, I'm just going to read the middle school statement. I'm just going to represent them. Um, so counselors provide a nurturing environment that supports the growth of students into socially responsible, independent, and collaborative community participants. Counselors prepare lifelong learners for the world by helping to promote intellectual curiosity and develop cultural proficiency and healthy relationships. Counselors work with students, parents, faculty, and the community to advance social emotional skills, develop resilience, and foster the mental and physical well-being of the whole student. Um, their, their vision in a quick um, wrap-up is supporting well-being, growth, and resilience. For high school, um, we have, like Kathy said, revamped our statement. Um, the AHS School Counseling Department fosters overall wellness, academic and career success, and life skill development. We collaborate in empowering students to reach their fullest potential. We support the social emotional well being of students through building healthy and diverse relationships and setting personalized goals. We promote the development of self-advocacy skills, including the ability to access, access supports, counseling, academic help, and self-awareness around the areas of strength and weakness. The department focuses on developing lifelong learners, resiliency, and intellectual curiosity as the whole student prepares for an ever-changing global community. Some important things to just highlight um, is just that as a team, you know, we collaborate with administrators, teachers, staff. We have weekly student support team meetings. We connect with social workers, um, outside of school agencies, with families, parents. So broadly, as a department, um, we connect within and outside, outside of school. Um, one of our strengths is we have a very experienced staff. Um, we've been here for a very long time. Um, we were very fortunate enough to have a new counselor added to our, um, to our group of five, or now six, so we have, we have extra supports. Um, we also use Naviance um, in depth, so with, for curriculum, nine through 12, um, support self-exploration and planning. We go over learning styles, career ex exploration. Um, we do a personality profiler. We do our post-secondary planning, college research, um, all within that system. So we have a 9 through 12 comprehensive curriculum that goes along with the Massachusetts model. Um, Did you know that? I'm going to interrupt for a second. Yeah. Did you know that we have a comprehensive school counseling framework replete with standards and lessons and so on? It's not something that many people know about. So thank you for bringing that up, Danielle. And one other thing to point out, um, we have our caseload. Um, we break down by alphabet, and so we follow the students for four years. So we actually get to know them, and for the most part, we have their siblings, so we get to know the families, and we are able to connect with them um, you know, throughout their whole high school experience from transition, like Kathy said, all the way through graduation and planning for after graduation. We also partner with uh, different agencies and folks in the community, and I think it's a nice coincidence that Karen Koreski and Cindy Bouvier are here today, who we work with through the Arlington Youth Health and Safety Coalition. Um, we've worked with Cindy for many years on initiatives in the district as well. So um, we feel fortunate to work in a town um, and a school district that really supports the health and wellness of students um, and is open to new initiatives over time. So we thank everyone for that. There are a couple of other documents as well in the files that give you a bit more information about the qualifications of school counselors. Also, a little known fact is that school counselors are one of the few people in schools that, that must have their master's degree as, long, as well as multiple, multiple hours and different modes of internship before they are allowed to even practice as a school counselor. That's not the case with many other folks. I can think of nurses and maybe specialists like OT and PT and so on. But all of our school counselors are highly qualified because of that. And then in order to have your professional license, you have to have 60 plus graduate credit hours um, plus continuing education and PDPs. So again, highly qualified staff are working with our students. And not only that, but you said 17 years? So <laughs> not their first rodeo. <laughs> Currently in Arlington, we have the role of school counselor at the middle school, the Gibbs, the Audison, and the high school. Um, there are 
a couple of different types of licensure and certification at the state level. In Arlington, we have both school counselors and school adjustment counselors, also known as school social workers, within the school counseling department. Um, most, all of our counselors at the high school are certified as school counselors. At Audison and Gibbs, there is a mix of school counseling and school adjustment counseling. Believe it or not, uh, as much as there are similarities, there are also differences between those training routes. And sometimes uh, folks don't really know what those differences are. I like how Danielle explained that we work within the four walls with our students, but we also collaborate with outside partners in the community. And there is a lot more training on the school counselor licensure side in terms of how to deliver that comprehensive counseling program, thinking proactively, how do we get all of this information out to all the students and, and really universally support kids at that tier one level. <coughs> Your school adjustment counselors have a little less of the programmatic development and delivery and more of the interfacing with case management and folks in the community. So they're both valid and valuable skill sets for Arlington, but it's also great to know that for us in the role of school counselor, we have a couple of different certifications serving in that job title. Um, Rest, the rest of those slides will help give you some information if you want to learn more about it. As Danielle also said, we are now officially in the district for our school counselors at caseloads of 250 students to one counselor or better. This is the first time since I've been here and I believe the first time in a long time that we've been able to be a fully staffed counseling department. So that's something we want to celebrate. And it also gives us the chance to start branching out and no longer dealing with just crises and individual kids as they come through the office, but actually start to do more of that preventative whole school work, which is really exciting for us. I wanted to take a second. Um, we have our two lovely lead counselors who are here to say hello, but everybody else also sends their best. <laughs> Happy at this point. This is my second year at Gibbs. And I'm Ryan I'm the other school counselor at the Gibbs. Uh, I'm in my 18th year in Arlington, second at the Gibbs. Uh, and same here, if you see me around the building, stop in and say hi. I'm Les Engelstrom. I'm sorry I can't make it tonight. I've been here six years, and you can usually find me out on the track field in the spring. And I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Hi, I'm Karen Lichter. I'm one of the school counselors here. I've been here for 10 years. Before that, I was at the office in middle school for two years. And I'm really enjoying working with the high school students. I love the community. I love being here. Um, I went to Boston University and studied business management and um, realized that I really wanted to be in a helping profession. So I went back to school. And here I am a school counselor, and I'm very happy to be continuing to work here. I'm Ryan Fox, I'm the school counselor at Arlington High School. Um, super excited to be back in the halls. I was a former student here many years ago, and it was nice to have one year in the building that I, I remember so fondly, and it's great to be back in the community where I grew up. So, uh, if you see me out in the local community or any events, please feel free to say hello, introduce yourself. Uh, I'm really excited to, to get to work with the community. Hi, my name is Ann Benson. I am a high school counselor here at Arlington High School, and I'm so thrilled to be here. I am in my second year here as a school counselor, so thank you for um, understanding the need for more staff here. One of my favorite things about working here is having the opportunity to work with adolescents. My prior professional experience is working in higher education. I worked at Boston University for almost 15 years in admissions and academic advising, and was hoping I would be able to make a shift to work in a high school. And I feel so fortunate to work here, and I'm really looking forward to another great year here. So thank you so much for making this opportunity possible for me. Hi, I'm Nancy Siegel. I'm one of the school counselors here in Audison. I work with the 8th grade, and I also advise the QSA. Hi, I'm Laura Key, 8th grade school counselor. Uh, I also live in Arlington and have a 5th grader and an 11th grader in EDS. I'm Brian Christie. I'm a school counselor here at Audison for seventh grade, last name L-I-P-Z. Uh, it's my third year here at Audison. Before this, I worked doing family therapy, and I was in the college counseling center. Hi, I'm Amy Bistrian. I'm the other seventh grade school counselor. This is my fifth year here at Audison. 
So I just want to ask um, if folks have any questions. I believe this was the last thing I wanted to leave you with was we have now a monthly school counseling newsletter that we're putting out internally to staff and school committee to help increase awareness about the department, about the depth and breadth of what we can do, and to hopefully increase um, efficacy with how other folks choose to interface with us. So with that, do folks have any questions? Uh, go ahead, Mr. Hainer. First off, I'd like to thank you. Your enthusiasm is uh, contagious, and it's really wonderful. I'm really excited. Did I miss it, or is, there, is your program at the elementary level as well? So we don't have traditional school counseling at the elementary level. We have school social workers at the elementary level who do provide a, they have a mixed role. They provide the school counseling prevention and whole school support as well as servicing students who require special education services. Is the ratio similar? Um, that I actually don't know about. I know that we have, the, the ratios are not as similar because for many of our buildings there's only one school social worker and we know our buildings are much larger than 250, right? Thank you. Yeah. Um, Ms. Seuss? Um, oh, just a similar question and then actually a complaint. <laughs> so, um, so the similar question is uh, just to tell me how the middle school level looks in terms of the adjustment counselors or, or what we think of as school counselors and versus, uh, I mean, our sort of social workers versus counselors. So how many at Audison and Gibbs and the high school of, uh, are there of social workers? Sure, so for our department, we have four school counselors that are serving in the role as a school counselor like we've been discussing, mm -hmm. and their route to certification is through school adjustment counseling. Mm -hmm. So their certification is as a school social worker, and they're serving in the role of school counselor, and I believe all but one, and maybe all of them at this point, ha also have their um, LMHC or LCSW. So everyone wears both hats, you're saying? No. Okay. It's um, the best way. You know, if you have like a bachelor's of science or a bachelor's Oh, no, I was just wondering art. the numbers. In terms of the numbers? Yeah, how many at each school? So there are four school counselors at the Audison, two at Gibbs, and then six at the high school. Okay, and then for social workers? Social workers is outside of this department. So oh, I, I know okay. at the high school, we have two social workers that are connected to the counselors, mm -hmm. Andrea Razi and Jessica Clow, mm -hmm. um, and they do work with us in terms of a small groups, tiered supports, um, making referrals and so on. But that's um, a high school specific model where they're okay. connected to the department, but they're not school counselors in the sense of this job title and, Got it. Okay. and set of roles. No, okay. Just and so can I clarify that? Sorry. So we do have um, some of our counselors, both at the high school and middle school, mm -hmm. have dual licensure in school counseling and school adjustment counseling. There's mm -hmm. a, a couple. I can't, I don't know exactly how many. Um, but in addition to the, the, social, the school social workers that, um, that Sarah just mentioned who are at the high school that are connected to the counseling department, mm -hmm. we also have school social workers at the high school and the middle school who okay. are connected to the special education department. Oh, uh, okay. And provide okay. special education uh, so social work services that are required under IEPs. Mm -hmm. I, I just know we've increased these numbers, and so I was just, yes. I don't really, I don't have a picture of what it looks like anymore. Um, so here's my complaint. So, <laughs> so there are many other, there are many other individuals throughout the district from pre-K through 12 that do hold the social work licensure mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the state or um, LICSW or LCSW or LMHC serving in a, a myriad of roles. Mm -hmm. And then I was just speaking about these folks. But yes, thank okay. you, Rep, for helping to clarify. So last year, my son was a senior applying to colleges when they added a school counselor. Yes. And, had, and he was on the edge. And so he had a really nice, wonderful relationship with his school counselor, knew him really well, could have written him a great recommendation. September 1st, he may no longer see that person. She, I mean, he can go see her, but you know, she could not write his letter. You know, it, it, so he had had this great relationship. So I know that we're going to encounter this again. We're adding students, a lot of students at the high school. Um, I hope that doesn't happen again. That was incredibly disruptive for the families um, who went through that. And so I would hope that if you're close to the college application process, if you're a senior or even a junior, that you guys sort of get grandfathered in with the per current person, and then you make the adjustments later. I would, so it was very disruptive for a lot of families. Yeah, you definitely were not the only family that <laughs> had that experience last year. We actually spent a lot of time working on that intentionally last year. It was uh, many months of discussion throughout the department, checking in with um, many other districts within our Middlesex region and trying to make sure we made the 
most ethical decision for the students because they were our first priority. And being that the caseloads for our counselors, especially the seniors, when you have to put together all of their, their process for application and so on, they were quite high numbers. That's why we added the additional counselor. And so we, we hemmed and hawed about do we or don't we disrupt who owns the students officially? And it came down um, pretty unanimously that the decision was we needed to, in the best interest of the students, make sure that they were on a reduced caseload, that they were moved over to a new counselor if they needed to move. We also made switches to minimize the alphabetic split, mm -hmm. um, but that we wanted them to have greater access to their counselor, not yeah. necessarily the longest relationship. And then we dedicated a number of months of time in meetings where counselors uh, partnered up and started working on where there had been handoffs, right? So letters weren't written in isolation, not having known that family or that student. They worked really hard as professionals to collaborate and share notes, but they also gave out surveys to students, surveys to families and to staff to make sure that their, their support of that student was, was really robust. We hope in the future to be able to do a bit of a phased in approach, but I can tell you, and the counselors will echo it, having a part-time counselor is a very poor idea. Um, so even though our enrollment may suggest there's only a necessity for a part-time counselor, which was the case when we added our sixth counselor to the group, um, we make the case for and continue to push for adding a whole full-time counselor because then that person's here every day of the week. In terms of accessibility for students, they don't schedule when they need support. Mm -hmm. And so those were a number of the, the things that went into our decision. Uh, it didn't work for our family. I mean, we just basically flew blind. By our, I mean, we just did it, had to do everything on our own because, you know, basically we did, the person that we knew really well and that our student knew, our, our kid knew very well was not available to him anymore. So if you're, we're open to suggestions too. If there's, if there's other things that you've lived that you said, yeah, hey, I this think, would have been I helpful, think definitely, if you're, definitely let us you know. You get to a senior year, you should be, you should stay with the same person you've had for three years. Okay. You Thank know, you. at least, at the very least, you know, that you shouldn't be forced to transition to a new person first day of senior year. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Stuckman. Okay. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I love the video and I hope that it gets posted someplace so we can see it without the glare of the. That's great. Uh, the lights, uh, and Thanks. I think the community would enjoy meeting the counselors as well. I agree, so we should get the two of you on tape too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can't see. Um, <laughs> so, so my question is, is you know, we, we've reached the 250 to one. Yes. So life is good, life is happy. We are a board that takes action. And so whenever we have a presentation, I sort of look for actionable items. Is there something we should know or be thinking about going forward? Beautiful. Thank you for that. I would love for you to read the article on what it is that guidance counselors used to do and what mm. it is that school counselors now do and become familiar with the Massachusetts mass model of counseling. Mm -hmm. It is based on the national ASCA, the American School Counselor Association. They have a beautiful, well put together, robust, comprehensive school counseling program that goes from K through 12. Mm -hmm. We currently in the district are able to implement bits and pieces of that and promising pockets, um, but we are now fully staffed to the place where we can start to branch out and think about how can we actually reach out to more kids quicker, more proactively. Uh, a small example is, is what's been happening with seminars. So now that we have some flexibility in the schedule with Dr. Janger, um, and we have enough counselors with smaller caseloads. We've been talking about and trying to figure out how do we schedule seminars in for students so that counselors are no longer pulling them from mm -hmm. classes or directed studies, but rather it's scheduled as a part of their day. And this way, counselors aren't you know, missing kids and trying to chase them down. Mm -hmm. So that's a very small example that's helping us move towards greater access to kids, giving them more proactive support. Um, Anything, you know, we're not yet at the point where we have tangible systemic asks, staffing asks, curricular asks, but just knowing what it is that school counselors can and should be doing, and it's way beyond dealing with crises and calling mm -hmm. therapists and applying to colleges. Um, they'd love to be out doing skills and techniques for kids that are building preventative skills and, and helping to bring down our YRBS, you know, mental health data points and things like that. And we're finally at the place where we can begin to do that. So to learn about that model, to think about how Arlington can embrace it, mm -hmm. and then to have our back would be beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I've, I've got a few for you as well. Um, 
So you mentioned that you have a school counseling framework, and you also just mentioned this mass model of counseling. Yes. Are these like documents or things that you know, we can look at or you can present at some point? Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Schoolcounselor.org, I'll, I'll send links yeah. and, and get them out to you all. The Massachusetts model is based off of the national model. So mm -hmm. they are aligned. It's just been tailored to Massachusetts. Massachusetts is one of the few states that doesn't actually require or have accountability measures around school counselors implementing a model. Mm -hmm. So um, we are unique in that, and that's part of why Massachusetts adopted their own. But there is a new fourth edition for school counseling model nationally. And since the mass model aligns with that, we follow as best as we can all of both of those models mm -hmm. as they apply to us. Yeah. There are tomes of information on them. <laughs> um, I will start to get them your way. This was my intention, was hope to develop some knowledge and hunger to learn more. Yeah, about well, I, think, I think there's interest mm -hmm. in, you know, obviously social and emotional wellness and, you know, your, your, the school counselor role in developing that. Um, uh, I think, you know, we, we wanted, you know, we, we need to devote resources we want to um, because that's sort of in society in general and in Arlington and you know as well it's, it's still a big issue right Absolutely. so so stress and anxiety and you know it causes special education issues it, it, there's lots of stuff that we still need to do a lot of work that's sort of why we agreed to, to create your position to begin with that's was mm -hmm. to help to try to tackle some of that and pay some attention to it mm -hmm. so to the extent that you are you know what your plan is for the next few years, if you have that together, or if you can get that together, Absolutely. whether it's adopting the mass model or you know certain aspects that you want to highlight, that would be great if you could come back you know later in the year Perfect. with that kind of presentation, and then we you know with the budget we can see if we need to if we need to support that or you know or not. Um, so that would be great. The other question, so I'm still a little bit confused about this school adjustment counselor school counselor split. So if you know the 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 school counselors have a very big role and do lots of different things, but it, is everybody qualified to sort of do the sort of social work type aspect of the job where a student is having a crisis or a student is having, you know, uh, bullying issues or all that kind of stuff? Absolutely. So everybody is qualified to do that. Absolutely. That's not just the adjustment counselors. Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. So the adjustment counselor is, how is their education different and training different? Sure. So there will be, um, perhaps more family and cultural family systems, group mm -hmm. therapy, modalities of counseling, those are um, often explored a bit more in depth because social workers and adjustment counselors often run small groups, work within family units, um, partner out into the community. So they will have more in-depth training on that. When you're going through the school counseling track, you definitely get modalities of counseling, but it's mm -hmm. much more brief, solution-focused, student-focused therapeutic techniques because the maximum that you're seeing a student mm -hmm. is for a period or a session. Um, and there's definitely information on that all of these mm -hmm. pathways deal with threat assessment, crisis, safety, harm, and so on. Um, but there's definitely more in-depth clinical skills and mm -hmm. explored just because of the, the dynamics of who school adjustment counselors can work with. There's less of a focus in that stream of training on the seminar model, on the instructional for a whole class or a whole group prevention mm -hmm. model. It's not absent. Neither are absent a skill set. Yeah. They're just focused a little bit more on one or the other based on the traditional mechanisms of the role. So traditionally, school counselors are in schools and they're able to deliver seminars and um, preventative information and education, psychoed and things, and create safe environments. The uh, social, uh, sorry, I have so many acronyms in my head. The um, school adjustment counselors are often asked to go out to courts and to, you know, Department of Transitional Assistance and work with all the different agencies to support families. Mm -hmm. So they have some more background and experience in that. Um, so I, I think you said we have a mix of those two at the middle school. We do. But we don't at the high school? At the high school, Andrea Razi and Jess Clow are school adjustment counselors as well as LCSWs. And so there at the high school, the roles are uh, split up a bit more. So we okay. have our two social workers are not working on college applications. They're right. not working right. on that process, post-secondary planning and things like that, setting up schedules. They're focused more so on meeting with the students and their families, running small groups and things. But they're not part of your department? They are part of our school counseling department, okay. but they do not hold the traditional role of a school counselor who's working on the applications and so on. Yeah. Okay. 
they, they um, adhere a bit more strictly to the school social work, really working on more of the tier two, tier three supports. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. It's, I'm so glad you're asking these questions because I think we all have mixed understandings of it. And then every district has their own iteration of how they invite folks into yeah. those roles, regardless of their training backgrounds. So I think it's just helpful to know that there are many different options and we use them in many different ways. Um, okay, and the, so the last thing was um, the preventative whole school work. Again, as, as you start to develop that, it would be great to come back and present, this is what we're doing at Stratton, this is what we're doing at Audison, you know, just so we can promote that to the community and, and hear what, what's going on. Absolutely. Thank all right. you all so much. Anybody else have any other questions? Great. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy Thank and you. Danielle. All right, so next we have the review of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. <clears throat> uh, Oh. Does this work with that? The clicker should work. Yep. Sure. Okay. Definite maybe. <laughs> what? A definite maybe. A definite maybe. Okay, I will take. And why don't you introduce yourselves in your role? Yeah, um, absolutely. So thank, thank you, you for the opportunity to come speak with you. I'm Karen Koretsky. I'm the director of the Arlington Youth Health and Safety Coalition. And I'm Cindy Bubia. Nice to see you all. I am um, officially a retired person, but I still work here <laughs> and um, a day a week. And I also help out. I, I work with the um, coalition, and I have done the Youth Risk Behavior Survey for many, many years, um, over 20 years. And so I'm still involved with that. And I also um, work with some of the physical education and wellness people in town. So, off we go. Um, you'll, I, hopefully you've each received a copy of this report. I'm not going to read every slide verbatim, so don't, don't fear not. I'm going to just highlight um, rele relevant sections. Um, on this slide, I just wanted to give you some detailed information about respondents. Uh, Arlington High School had a total of 907 students, and this gives you some breakdown about their ethnicity and their grade level, male, female, you can look at that later, other gender. OMS had a total of 729 students. And somehow we skipped Gibbs, but Gibbs had a total of 417 students. So as you can see, that's a really successful and comprehensive data collection. We were participants in the Middlesex League um, collection of the YRBS. And I, again, give you the history of the Middlesex League, but I think the most important thing to point out is we talk about comparisons to other districts. Um, we're looking at Arlington, Burlington, Belmont, Lexington, Melrose, Stoneham, Reading, Wakefield, Watertown, Wilmington, Winchester, and Woburn. So those, were the, those are the towns that are um, participants in the Middlesex League. What is the YRBS? I'm not going to go over that. You're probably familiar with it, but I want you to understand that it was developed in 1990, so it has a long history. It's been a long, successful data collection. Um, and its main purpose is to develop, I mean, is to examine the health behaviors among our student population. I'm happy to go over a little bit of the history of that. Prior in the 1990s and, and forward to 2017, we always did this on pen and paper. So in 2017, we joined this Middlesex League, and now we're compared with just surrounding communities. It, we used to be compared with the entire state, mm -hmm. um, and then we, did our, when, then we started our own, so we had our own data for just Arlington. This Middlesex League now gives us data for just Arlington and also gives us data that compares us to surrounding communities. And in 2017, we started on doing it electronically with the high school. And this past year was the first time we did it electronically with the middle school and the Gibbs. It should also be noted, too, that the report that we received from the Middlesex <laughs> League, which was compiled by the John Snow Institute, does not only give us comparisons to neighboring communities in the district, but national averages and state averages. So it's, it's a nice um, assessment. So. 
This is a graph that talks about the lifetime use of alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs among high school students in the Middlesex League. It's really a synopsis before I break down into some of the categories and get, give you some more details. But the big three across the district are alcohol at an average of 55.9%, so 56%, vapes at um, the level of 40.1% and marijuana at 33.4. So probably no big surprises there. Um, those numbers, uh, alcohol has remained consistent, but vapes, of course, that category is a new and emerging thing that surprised us. So now let's talk a little in detail about the results that I thought were notable from alcohol use. 58% um, report ever drinking alcohol, which is the same as 2017. So that shows you that there hasn't been much of a cultural or community shift um, among the student population. There was a decline in the, present, in the percent of Arlington High School students who currently drink from 27.9% in 2017 to 24.5% in 2019. So that's positive. We're seeing a slight reduction in the number of students who currently drink. There was also a decline in the percent, percent of students who binge drink. It went from 16% in 2017 to 11.6 in 2019. That's a very positive reduction also. Middle school students are less likely to drink alcohol than mm -hmm. Arlington middle school students were less likely to drink alcohol than their Middlesex League counterparts. Uh, so Arlington was at 12.8% compared to 13.1%. So that's a slight reduction or a slight difference. So my conclusions are that alcohol rates have decreased, but current use is still reported by 25% of the population. And what I find alarming is half of those who drink binge drink. So we've got a 12% report of binge drinking. We're going to continue to educate parents and students and create policies and procedures to help reduce access and use. And we can talk about that more if, you're, um, if you have any questions at the end. I wanted to give, for those of you that respond well to imagery, a map. So that is in your handout so you can see how Arlington fares compared to other areas in the district in the Middlesex League. And now we'll take a closer look at marijuana. So there is an increase in rates of lifetime and current use of marijuana at Arlington High School. Students that, it, that have used in 2019 were 35%, and that was a jump from 32% in 2017. Um, if I was to go back further and look at data prior to 2017, we've seen an inching up um, since legalization and access has become more available. Students reporting current use was 21.5%, so that's a slight increase from 20.4% in 2017. And Arlington High School marijuana use is slightly higher than the district averages of lifetime use. Arlington High, um, so the district averages of lifetime use, 33.4, okay. So Arlington High's district average of lifetime use was 33.4, and for current use it was 20.7. Middle school students are 2.9% less likely than other district students to use marijuana. Arlington students fared best in the district for having the lowest percent, 4.4% of students who tried marijuana before the age of 13. So that's pretty cool. That tells us that our prevention outreach that we're doing early on is very positive. Um, and that's where I'm going to take a little sidestep and say, you know, the Arlington Youth and Health Safety Coalition is, has historically been funded by a federal <coughs> grant. And the federal grant, had, federal grant had very specific restrictions. It specified that the education and prevention outreach was to be extended to middle school and high school students only. I've always seen um, an opportunity to even start conversations about healthy versus non-healthy behavior, maybe with fifth graders, you know, to start a little younger. And I, the more I see, coming back from data collection, the more I see that you have young students, fifth and, well, sixth and seventh graders, reporting high um, incidents or feelings of stress, anxiety, depression, and really, really low substance use. 
So to me, I always say that that's the sweet spot. If we can talk to them at that age about prevention and about how they can manage these feelings of discomfort um, without turning to substance use, that is where we're going to help out help the outcomes here in the community. Um, over half of Arlington High students see little to no risk for harm when it comes to using marijuana once or twice a week. So 34.6% said there was a little risk, 21.9% said there's no risk. That's alarming because we know that with legalization, again, they're getting a message that legal means safe. And we know that marijuana use is not safe for the developing brain. So that, there's no question about that. What a, an adult does is a different issue, but when the brain is still developing, it's not a healthy thing. So my conclusions are legalization and dispensaries are sending mixed messages to our youth. Ease of access, which means vaping, <coughs> um, enables consumption of THC in school and secretively. Enhancing the education of middle school students before use is a goal, and conversations about perception of harm would be really important. Next, we're going to go on to other drugs. Most prevalent in Arlington is non-prescribed <coughs> or improperly used Rx medicine at 3.8%, but still used less than the district at 57 So Arlington is faring really well. Our kids are not abusing prescription meds at the same levels as our neighboring communities, which is great. However, there was an increase in the percent of students, so 17.2% of Arlington High students reported that they were offered, sold, or given an illegal drug on school property. So that 17.2% this year jumped from 135 in 2017. And Arlington fared worse in the region at 13.6, but better than the Commonwealth at 20.1% and the state 19.8%. I talked to Chief Flaherty about this, and you know she knows that this is an issue and, and is going to take a look at what the police department can do to see why this perception is there. Um, in Arlington High, only 2% have ever used cocaine, 1.1% have used heroin, and 1.7% reported using inhalants. So that, those are very low numbers, and that's very reassuring. 74.6% see themselves at risk if they use an Rx drug not prescribed to them. So three quarters of them know that it's not a healthy thing to do. And yet, you know, there's still some that are doing it. So conclusions are illicit drug use, rate, use rates excuse me, are very, very low, but the availability of Rx drugs on campus is increasing, and we need to address that. The next slide is a breakdown of drug use among school districts. I'll let you look at that on, in, your, in your free time. The next slide is about tobacco, nicotine, and vapes. That is the topic du jour. Um, AHS rates of lifetime cigarette use remains at 11.6, which was the same in 2017. However, AHS rates of current use of e-cigarettes rose significantly from 8.3% in 2017 to 22.6% in 2019. The number of Arlington High students who report they've ever vaped is 37.7%, and the ones that report vaping on school property is 8.8%. 42.7% see themselves at moderate risk for harming themselves using vapes. 38.5% see a great risk, and yet they still do it. Middle school students, 53.4% oh, of students who use tobacco and nicotine products did not try to quit in the last 12 months. So even though 42.7% see themselves at moderate risk for harming themselves, they're still not trying to quit. Middle school students who tried cigarettes were at a rate of 1.9%. Middle school students who had ever used a vape were 7.4%, and those who currently use vapes are 35 And anecdotally, that's what I'm hearing from students who know other students, that they're seeing an alarming number of middle school students using these products, and that is very concerning. I'm very proud of a group I lead here at Arlington High. We have our student activists in the 84 Club, and they uh, engage in research and peer support group to help change the climate in school. They create posters, they go to conferences, they lobby at Kick Butts Day, and 
one of their recommendations at the end of their research project last year was that we create a vaping cessation program for teens um, off school grounds where they can come and get support. And we're launching that next week. Uh, Thursday, it's going to take place at Robbins Library, and it's going to be every Thursday and open to anybody who is concerned either about their own vaping use or a peer or friend's vaping use. And I'm going to be facilitating that. So I'm looking forward to that. It's also notable to mention that Arlington High School and Audison Middle School, we don't suspend students for a first violation of vaping. Uh, we believe that school is a protective factor and that um, use of vaping anything is a red flag. It's indicating that the student is choosing to do something that's risky behavior. So rather than get them out of school and punish them, we have them meet with me or a clinician from AYCC and engage in two motivational interview sessions in which we look at their use in a non-judgmental way and see how we might help them if they want to move on and, and, and try to quit smoking. And if there's more serious issues, we're then able to make a recommendation to a clinician at AYCC. Maybe they'll seek some counseling, because again, maybe this is a red flag of something else. So I'm really proud of Arlington High and Audison for coming up with that policy. And you know, a lot of schools are so having the zero tolerancy, let's, let's kick them out. And we don't have that attitude. I think it's important to also know that despite our good intentions and our efforts, we're fighting against social media and how influencers are sort of promoting the use of vaping products as trendy and safe. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hard battle to win. Uh, here's a chart that indicates tobacco and vaping use in the Middlesex League. And at this point, I'll hand it over to Cindy. And then I guess if you have any questions, so, we can go over them at the end. Yeah, at the end. I, I will tell you that for the past 25 years, we've been so proud of bringing the tobacco levels down so much, and that happened over years of work. And now you've seen what's happened. The explosion of the vaping issue in the past two, three years, has, it's, it's out of control, and there's all these dangers. And so it took a long time to find out that smoking was definitely so bad for you and for people to internalize that and to stop. And then, and then you have this situation that is in front of us. So it's not, a, it's not an easy situation right now. So I'm here to talk a little bit more about the personal safety. And I think that, um, so am I going to go this way or uh, this way? Yes. Okay. Um, I think that for the most part, the personal safety is positive and that most things have decreased. Um, um, almost all, but, but one has decreased. Although I'm going to say with that, I think we still have some concerns in that as much as the, the percentage has decreased and we are below the Middlesex League in this, um, we still have quite a few students that have their, their property stolen or damaged on school property. And we also have a pretty significant amount of students that say they have been physically abused by a parent or adult in their home. Mm -hmm. So that, those are still at 14%. When you're thinking about 900 people, you really have to go to, okay, that's maybe 120 to 130 students that are saying that. So I think that that's significant. Um, so as, as much as only 4.7 students say that they drank when, and drove at the same time, um, which is a decrease. We still probably have about 70 students who said that they've driven in the past two years under, after smoking marijuana, two hours, within two hours. So I think that that is significant if 70 students are out there driving after having smoked marijuana. Um, the one increase um, from 2017 that I can see is the texting while driving. Um, I think that, that that's the one area of increase. So um, as a conclusion, I mean, and very positive, at our middle school, 84% of them actually said that they wear a helmet, except for the two that I drove by on the, this morning. 84% uh, of them said that they wear a helmet when they bike ride. I saw these two coming down Mass Ave, and I went, they're not part of the 84%. Yeah. Um, so, that's, that's all positive. And the coalition, which Karen is involved with, has launched a drug driving unit in Driver's Ed to help to raise awareness. You can ask her about that later. 
And I think through dean meetings, high school meetings, um, you know, RC, social emotional learning, I'm hoping that some of these numbers do decrease even more and the numbers of people decrease even more in the, in the future. So um, I, th I would say the responsive classroom and other social emotional programs as they, as they come up. Oh, thank you. Okay, so we're on to violence. Um, bullied on school property, there's a slight increase with that, 12.8% of our students, so up about a, a percent from 2017 say that they were bullied on school property, um, bullied electronically. High school students say they're not bullied electronically I, or at a very much lower rate than the middle school students. And 11.1% um, of high school students said that they were in a physical fight, which is a decrease from what it was before. These are very different than what the middle school is saying. Um, they're all a little bit higher. 14% at the middle school say that they um, have been bullied on school property. 30% say they've been bullied through social media or electronically. 31% said that they've been in a physical fight. So I'm not quite sure what they've, they're considering. Maybe we need to look at the question and, and word it maybe um, to make sure it's a physical fight. And 14.3% said, said that they carried a weapon. Um, I'm sort of wondering, um, you know, I think we need to delve into this a little bit more to, to see exactly what they're considering a weapon, even though we did, we did state it on the, um, on the question, but we, we need to look into that a little bit farther. Um, conclusion, Arlington had the lowest rates in the district for being in a physical fight. Um, I guess that's a positive. We still think that a lot of kids are, are, are getting into um, tussles with each other. Um, as far as the violence prevention goes, we're doing it in the facts department in the middle school. We're, we're doing violence prevention in the health in seventh and eighth grade and also in the ninth grade here at the high school. We have um, a program, a new program being planned on violence prevention with the police uh, in advisory. So there are a lot of things going on. Um, as far as sexual, thank you, Karen. As far as sexual health goes, um, the percentage of Arlington High School students has dropped that said that they, um, are actually have ever had um, sexual intercourse compared to 2017 and also um, also uh, the have, having use of or, or drugs or alcohol prior to having sexual intercourse has also decreased a little bit. So the percent of students who did not use a condom, that to me is um, something that we may want to discuss going forward. Um, 30, it, the, I think we need to look at the percent of students who did not use a condom during sexual intercourse arose, rose to 37.1%. Um, and it's one of the highest in the district despite 77% reporting having learned about birth control methods. So they're being taught about birth control, but they're not actually using the condoms. And because we've had um, the, a number of STDs and STIs in the district as well, I think that's a little bit concerning. And maybe it's time to talk about access once again, access to these, to these barriers. So because I've been involved in this in so, for so many years, it's not like this is new information, but I think that with time, time things change. And so maybe, um, you know, we would have to have some kind of school committee policy. And Sue Frank, I had a conversation with Sue Frankie, the director of nursing, about this as well. And she said she's willing to come to speak with you or talk with any of you about this situation. And also maybe we'll take it to a wellness committee this fall to talk a little bit about it. One of the things that Sue said, she works in, in a college clinic also, and I guess across the state, rates of gonorrhea and syphilis are on the rise. So. Um, that's an issue too. Mm -hmm. It is. And, um, it, you know, the condom is a, is a barrier that protects one against some of those things. Okay, 36.7% um, of high school students said they received something electronically of sexual nature. It's, it's neutral compared to what they said last time. 8.7% um, of students were sexually active, did not use any method of pregnancy during um, intercourse. That's a little concerning. 
but 50% of middle school students who were, sec who were sexually active, because that number is, is small, um, that's only 2.3% of middle school students, did not use a condom as well. So I guess when we look at conclusions to this, sexual activity is lower than the average for the region. It's lower as far as Arlington is concerned. Access to condoms at the high school students, um, I think we need to take a look at that. I think we need to take a look at that. Um, and it's especially as a barrier method as well. Um, let's see, the next slide nutrition. is on nutrition. I'm sure you all want to hear how many fruits and vegetables the kids have. I doubt it. But, um, but we will use that information. We will share it with food, with food services. And um, we will also talk about it in our, in our health classes as well. Um, one thing that was rather high, even though it's a neutral, is the number of sodas that kids are drinking. Mm. I, I don't know. It, it just, I, I thought, I see kids with water bottles and so on and so forth, but, but kids are still drinking soda. So that is something that is, that is concerning. And we don't sell any in the high school, that's for sure, or the middle school. Um, a positive note, 5.8% uh, of our students are at the obesity level. That's we, about six or seven years ago, were the lowest in the state for obesity levels because our nutrition was, was at a height. And 10.2% um, of our students, so about 90, 90 students say they don't eat breakfast in the morning. And to me, that's probably not as alarming because maybe they grab a bar and throw it in their backpack or something like that as how many students actually do not get, 72% of Arlington High School students did not get eight hours sleep. And we all know, okay, well maybe next year with the late start, that's gonna change. <laughs> We'll see. Um, but I think that's more alarming than, than any, any of the other stats. Um, a positive note, Arlington had the lowest rate of concussions. Yes, in the district. So um, that's a positive note for sure. Um, again, through health in seven and eight and nine and the Family and Consumer Science Department, uh, mindfulness electives that we have in high school, um, our social emotional learning, and hopefully through parent forums, some of these st stats will change um, as well, especially the screen time, because 40% of our, of our students said that they are on for more than three hours a day. So hopefully through parent forums and student attendance and discussions in classrooms, that will, that will improve. Okay, so we have one last slide, and that is our mental health slide, and we have our mental health expert here. Thank you, perfect. So we, uh, this is the most alarming piece to me, but this is not news to anybody. The, the very first line on this slide is that 82.6% of our high school students report feeling like they were under an overwhelming amount of stress and Arlington fared the worst in this category in the Middlesex League. And that warrants our attention and further discussion. Um, and it's, there's no documents here, but you could quickly look at the recent research where when students, high school students are reporting their levels of stress, it's not arbitrary, it's not, um, hyperbole, if you actually look at their bodies and how they're experiencing the stress as compared to when everybody in this room was experiencing stress as a teenager, the impact biologically on them, psychologically on them is significantly higher um, than what your average middle age adult feels for being really stressed in this day and age. So it's worth looking at because it's pretty intense, their experience. Um, it's not just their perception. And yet, they have a lot of healthy skills. So the second item is that they have healthy activities. Most of our students have healthy activities. Um, jumping down to the bottom line, you'll see 80, almost 83% of our students have somebody that they can talk to who's a parent or an adult family member about things that are important. So that's very promising to see those protective factors in place. In terms of thinking about suicidality, 11% of our students reported wanting um, Wanting a serious thought, that's an odd phrasing. But they, 
they reported having a thought of suicide, which was a decrease from 14%, which is uh, a very promising move in just two years. 15.3% of students report wanting to do something to injure themselves, so non-suicidal self-injury. It's different from having thoughts of suicide. Those are students who are, if you were to, um, you'd hear this in the youth mental health first aid class, right? When students are trying to injure themselves, their intention is to achieve some sort of relief from the overwhelming feelings that they're experiencing. That's not an intention to end your life. It's very different from suicidality, so it's important to understand that those, those two questions are very different in what they're assessing. 25.7% of our high school students report feeling hopeless or sad every day for over two weeks in a row. That's not diagnostic, but it's the beginning of the diagnostic criteria for depression. And so it's a, an easy way of getting a sense of roughly how many of our kids are feeling so lousy that they could warrant a conversation about their mental health. And so a quarter of our kids, you know, every class, a quarter of our kids feeling depressed or hopeless or sad, that's a lot. It's definitely a lot. Um, and in our schools, 61.3% of our students report that they have an adult in the school that they can speak with. I think we can do better. I know we can do better. And I know that that's a, a number that Dr. Bodie has mentioned before and wondering why is it that only a little over half of our kids feel like they have somebody in the building, especially in the high school when you have so many adults you can pick from. Why is it that only a little over half have that? So that's part of why we're doing the Youth Mental Health First Aid is to increase the skills that our teachers and our adults have to establish those relationships and the advisory is working towards that too. So, and this is where Karen was mentioning earlier too, you know, how can we engage in more productive conversations about stress? How can we help students develop their own frustration, tolerance, being able to deal with uncomfortable situations, um, find some skills, move their way through it? And then also, how do they get help for those overwhelming feelings? And um, obviously, we need to continue to promote resources for suicide prevention and destigmatize mental health. We have trained over 300 and I think 350 staff in Arlington in the Youth Mental Health First Aid, but we are not done. We want to continue to work on that. Um, and there's definitely a, a lot of work around how do we destigmatize conversations around it, even when we're talking about how to best meet kids' needs. When they're in the classroom, they're showing up, but they're feeling hopeless and sad. What can we do as teachers to create safe spaces for them? And this is just... Um, a visual representation of the suicidal ideation among high school students. And you'll see it, although it uh, looks like the numbers increased, they're looking at the population that reported that they were feeling suicidal, if you start at the bottom, right? So they seriously considered attempting, and then if you move up to the next level, it's they actually had a plan about it versus those who attempt it, and then those that uh, resulted in an injury because of an attempt that they took. And at our middle school, um, similar trends regarding stress and feelings of being overwhelmed and school demands. 32.7% of our uh, middle schoolers report that they were overwhelmed and that the school demands were the biggest source of their stress. Other sources um, that weren't quite far behind were keeping up with their schoolwork, having their busy schedules, having to study things that you don't understand. Um, and this is on par with some national trends too. There was a recent book that just came out called Permission to Feel by Dr. Mark Brackett where he talks about um, the emotional intelligence of youth across the nation and what they're reporting as their number one causes of stress are nationally being reported as well. 15% of our middle school students report want to, um, having a serious thought of suicide and believe it or not, this is actually lower than the percentage in the middle sex league. 15% is still pretty high if we're thinking about our middle school students I mean, those are our 13-year-olds that are thinking about killing themselves. Mm -hmm. That's pretty intense. And 8.6% of them actually made a plan for it, which increases their risk for likelihood to take action and likelihood um, to um, have some type of injury from that. So we need to continue to talk about this and early and often and destigmatize it. So in conclusion, substance use continues to be a major problem among high school and middle school students with alcohol being the most reported use, substance in use. Um, in this age group, high rates of underage drinking and binge drinking were reported. Similarly, students have displayed considerable high rates of marijuana use, 
prescription drug abuse, smoking, and most notably an increase in the use of e-cigarettes and vaping products. And these numbers are consistent with national trends. Tobacco use, traditional tobacco seems to have declined. A high percentage of students in the league engage in behaviors that potentially increase the risk of unintentional injuries. So we talked about texting and driving and those kinds, smoking went under the influence of marijuana. The percentage of middle sex league students engaging in risky sexual behavior is noticeably high with a concerning number of students having early sexual encounters and reporting use of illicit drugs or alcohol before a sexual encounter. And we also noticed that a considerably high number of students in the Middlesex League have reported problems with mental health, including having frequent feelings of sadness as well as thoughts of suicide. With increasing rates of suicide across the nation, this is of course a major concern and with noting, worth noting. One in four high school students, so 26.5% in the Middlesex League region, reported they felt sad or hopeless most, al almost every day. So, do you have any questions? Sure we do. I'll start with Mr. Hainer. Uh, thank you for all your work, and it's very informative. I'm really concerned on that uh, slide you shared share with us on the personal safety, the 14% reporting physical abuse at home. Mm -hmm. And this may go to you, it may go to, uh, we may not have the answer right now. What are our protocols in place when a child talks about abuse at home? So all of the school employees, um, all town employees are mandated reporters. 51As are the forms that you complete when you hear any reports of any type of neglect or abuse. All of our staff have just recently actually undergone their annual um, required training. And so all staff have had the opportunity to ask questions, talk to their supervisors about it as well. But they're very well versed in what they need to look for, what kinds of questions they need to ask, and then how they report it. If I may just follow it up, yeah. how well do our students know that they have access to this communication ability? I mean, is that part of the regular curriculum where we tell kids that if you don't feel safe, tell a teacher, tell the nurse, tell somebody? I mean, I think. I, I was a teacher for 28 years. I, the mandated reporting, and we all took that very, very seriously, and when a child did do it. But I often wondered, and we didn't have anything to tell the kids it, it, say, before it happens in a proactive way, not a reactive way. In a, uh, I, I'm sure school systems, what, whatever, but I'm, I, I'm sure that if, if a child it goes really serious and a child gets killed or something like that, that system is going to do something. But that's a reactive thing. And I, I think it's, it's very important for children to know, yes, this is, we keep saying it's a safe place, but when you're not safe anywhere, you can still talk to us, as you said, talking to the different peoples and stuff like that. So I'd just like to share that with you. I'm not asking you to... It's a great question. Yeah. It, that, that number concerns me when you, do, when you did the, thank you for doing the numbers quickly from 14% to come out. And it also is concerning that only 61% of the students are talking to an adult in the building. So that one, part too. one goes with right. the other. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Alexander. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a couple questions. If what I'm curious about is I mean, it's really nice having the data across the Middlesex League, but I'm wondering, are you using the data in any ways? For example, um, if you look at what was your slide 13, is to make tobacco use and vaping in the Middlesex League. If, if you can go back to that. It's a graph one. Yeah. Um, so if you look at Belmont on that, for whatever reason, they have 25% less than the US average for vaping and apparently no tobacco use, which is wonderful. And if this is real, I'm just wondering, what are they doing? What, you know, can we do the same thing? Um, and the same thing is true um, <coughs> On the slide, um, which one twenty? The mental health, where you talk about that our students were faring the worst um, in terms of overwhelming stress. Well, I'm wondering what are the schools, 
what does the data look like for the other schools? Where is it better? What are they doing differently? Mm -hmm. And can't we just borrow their idea? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I'm just wondering, what, what are we doing in terms of trying to seek out information like that? I think that's a great question, and that's exactly how we approach this. When we get these results, we look at the red flags that are here and um, you know, figure out who we need to work with on specific things. Like, I, again, the guidance counselors were talking about our partnership. I would turn to Sarah, and we would you know, plan out something that has to do with addressing the mental health issues. The vaping and tobacco probably would fall within my um, work. And so that, that, again, would be something that I would look at. One of the reasons could be that Belmont didn't have anything in the tobacco category is because tobacco has been such a, uh, it's not even used anymore, that when some of the communities were developing their surveys, they, like we, for example, had seven questions pertaining to tobacco. Cindy and I winnowed it down to three. I think some communities, Belmont, might have just cut them all. They must have been like, nobody smoking cigarettes here at all anymore. So that's what that graph may have indicated. I'd okay. have to look. So that, that's the question. Is it a real difference? Right. Or is real it just difference, a, it? yeah. Right. But it just, it, it feels like you've got, it sounds like we've got some things where some districts are doing better than others at certain things. Can't we Mm -hmm. look across districts and find out what are they doing differently and then try and import it. Yes. Um, One of the things that um, I started about a year ago is I've started going to these regional coalition leader meetings and um, uh, cluster grant meetings, and I, some of them I'm sort of a part of their work, and then some of them I just go. And I'm finding that to be a great resource because I can then email a group of 15, 16 coalition directors and say, how do you address this? How do you address that? And recreating the wheel doesn't always have to take place. You can take some very um, effective strategies that they've implemented and use them in your community. Um, so, sure. Just along the last lines, um, Dr. McNeil and I were at a, a conference today, and we're going to be returning tomorrow talking about multi-tiered systems of supports, and specifically looking at social, emotional learning, and behavioral health, um, mental health data. Methuen is uh, a district that's similar in size to us, and um, they have done some really great work through their, it started with their high school, school counseling department, their guidance department where they looked at on the YRBS, these are the major reasons that kids are struggling. This is what they're reporting are their number one issues. So they said, let's pilot some basic universal screeners. Like, let's look at their anxiety and their, their depression, not <coughs> diagnosing it, but just how much is it inhibiting their life at school. And if we're noticing huge trends, let's push out and do a whole community plan to teach them better skills on mindfulness, breathing, biofeedback, different things. How do you actually understand ways that work on helping you bring down your stress levels and managing it, right? And then for students for whom that was insufficient, how do we have some smaller groups that are about an anxiety and, you know, maybe some CBT skills, cognitive behavioral therapy, different things. And then from those, you know, what are the kids that need something else? Let's refer them to AYCC. Let's get them connected to a social worker. So they've then branched out, and now they're doing these screeners with um, many of their high schoolers, if not all of them, to very quickly find out who's got moderate to severe levels of anxiety and depression and how can we, within the school, get into their classrooms and their spaces preventatively to start bringing down that feeling of overwhelm and stress. And so part of what I've been doing is talking with my colleagues and saying, what do your data points say? Has it been working? Has it been effective? What were the pitfalls you ran into? How can I learn from them so that we don't hit the same issues? And so um, I don't know if Rod had other things about that too, but it's promising. We're, we're learning about it right now. And by the end of the day tomorrow, we'll be able to come back with some, with some more um, tangible things that would apply to Arlington too. Okay. Okay, Ms. Seuss? Hi. Um, so I remember in previous years, we actually saw the questions and we saw them compared to previous years and it was really helpful. And I think especially with the mental health issues, there's some, some information that's presented as Middlesex League. We're not, it's not clear what's going on with Arlington specific. And so I think it'd be really helpful to see that. And that back then, there were some, you know, really sort of good news about substance use and then some 
you know, alarming increases over several years on mental health issues, it seems like that's probably, that seems like it's leveled out, but it'd just be interesting to see it. It was also helpful to see there was a breakdown by gender. I mean, it really, it just presented a fuller picture of the data that I thought was helpful. Um, yeah, yeah. We, can, we can, yeah, that's right. It'd be, it'd be great to see it. That'd be great yeah, if you could that ever. Thanks. That together. Yes, Sarah is telling me there, there was, we found some um, glaring errors in, in the report that we got from our um, evaluator, so. Got it, so that's why you don't want to pass it on. And, yeah. Okay, okay, we can put a little but I caveats. Think, but I agree, I think that's yeah. a great way to look at it, and that, we do look at it yeah. that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just seems like it's, it was hard to sort of suss it out from yeah. some of these slides in, in it. Um, then I also have a suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, so um, when my daughter's in middle school, she had some friends in crises, some of which she, there was like a discussion to a counselor and they really reached out. But there was at least one incident of something I learned years later of uh, dating violence where no one told anybody, right? <laughs> and so I've heard other districts do sort of this anonymous reporting type of thing where you can just drop a note saying I'm concerned about this friend anonymously and then there can be some sort of like, you know, very subtle reaching out to see, you know, what's going on. You know, I'd hope you wouldn't get too many false you know, things, but. So um, as far as I know, there is no anonymous reporting. Um, that happens, like a suggestion box yeah, or yeah. some kind of yeah. box where people would drop things in. Um, as far as I know, there, there isn't anything like that. Um, we do talk about some of the resources in, right. in some of the health classes and the family and, consumer science, family and consumer science classes. We do talk about some of the resources within the building that people can go to, that friends can go to. It mm -hmm. doesn't have to be the person that's being violated or yeah. the violence is happening against. It can be friends of that person. Yeah, I mean, just it, it seems like sometimes um, kids of that age, uh, and it's certainly applied to my daughter, aren't don't always trust adults around them, right? And so be, but they're worried about their friend, <laughs> mm -hmm. and they want to be have a way to to give that worry, but they don't really, tr you know, it, they're, it's such an awkward age. Yes, yes. Um, and so if there was, and I'd heard that that was done in other districts, and that's. And as yeah. we know, there's so much undue shame. There's no reason for it, but quite often people who are victims of those kind of attacks feel shame and then they don't report for that reason. So I think that's a great suggestion. It would be a great step, you know, to do that. Yeah. And my previous district had a text to tip process. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And that yeah. was really great. And that was through the coalition though. So okay. we might be able to figure out a way to do we'll something similar. Figure it out. Yeah. That's great. I think those kind of text to tips are, are great because they're anonymous. They, yeah, they that's provide exactly. that. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. 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 So, thank you for that. Sorry, Mr. Thielman. <laughs> so, um, I thought we were going. To, you know, it. Mm. You know, you were right, Cindy, when you said that um, mm. there was a lot of success in the anti-tobacco uh, mm -hmm. work over a long period of time. So it seems to me some of those strategies that the state used and that the district used could be applied, uh, since they they worked to vaping, maybe even a soda use. And I'm wondering if you've kind of if people in the the, the the, the, the service, the, this community of, of people that the counseling and mental health community have kind of kind of taken a look at, back at all the work that was done in the anti-tobacco efforts and all of the, the campaign, the, you know, the, the classes, the education, and kind of said, well, why don't we just take some of the things we, we used back then and apply it to vaping um, and to some of the other issues here? I think that um, if you look back, and you say to yourself, like, throughout those years, how did things progress? I think that you can look at um, the tobacco tax that was first added, that, when it, that went to schools to, to do tobacco education. It went to signs on buses. It went to signs on, uh, on, the, on the television to tell you how dangerous it was. And I actually think that somebody at the State House is really taking the lead with this and say, coming right out and saying this like quickly within, yep. you know, this vaping is new in the last how many years? Seven, 2017. 2017. So this is new since 2017. So I think they're coming out right now saying this is it. This is how dangerous it is. This is why it is dangerous. There are carcinogens in it. 
Uh, we're not sure whether it's from the black market, from, it's from the regular market, or where it's from right now, but there are a lot of dangers. So I feel like they're coming out with messages anyway. But what's hard, and this is what the students have even admitted, you know, tobacco um, had characteristics that were easy to, you know, point out, like um, you, you're going to smell, your hair is going to smell, your skin's going to wrinkle, your teeth will turn yellow. Um, it's very obvious when someone is smoking a cigarette, whereas vaping, it, it, they have these fruity, lovely smells, they're concealed easily. So it's very hard to get young people to realize that they're harmful because young people don't respond to oh, you're going to get sick, because they think they're never going to get old. So scare tactics don't work. But if you can stigmatize the product, like we did with cigarettes, and say, you know, you're going to smell, your teeth are going to be yellow, nobody's going to be around you, that is what resonates with them. Yeah, look, yeah. Um, I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to have a culture shift here in the at school and raise awareness of the fact that these products aren't regulated, that these young people are being treated as guinea pigs for a very greedy industry that has no regard for their health, and that is a message that's resonating with some of them, so. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Dr. You're McNeil, welcome. had something to add? Yes, I would like Cindy also to talk about the early education that we have at our elementary schools, uh, like the Great Body Shop. Yes. So I think part of this is like early intervention. Um, when you get to high school and you get to middle school, I think that it, it can be a little bit more difficult, mm -hmm. um, but we are doing a lot at the elementary level in order to, and it's part of our curriculum, in order to educate students about the harms of nicotine. So the new curriculum, um, the curriculum that's being um, taught by the, um, in the lower grades, does not have as much on the tobacco. It has, it has a lot on the, a different, in different topics. But in the fourth grade, there is a, there, we really start to, to delve into um, tobacco <coughs> education and use of vapings, and we have, transform those curriculum, that curriculum and those units into vaping more, especially at the sixth grade level as well. So, um, so the Great Body Shop is a curriculum that you all are aware of that we use um, in K through five now. But at the, at the fourth grade level, the fifth grade level, the sixth grade level, that's where we're starting to change the curriculum to talk more about vaping. Uh, the poster contests that you've seen that have come our way, um, those are all on vaping at this point. And I also like to have Sarah talk about the youth mental health uh, training that many of our staff have, have been a part of. Because as we look at the mental health epidemic, we want to be able to, you know, train our staff to be able to understand, like, what, you know, signs of trauma and being able to distinguish that from, like, Typical adolescent typical development. Typical ad <laughs> adolescent development, exactly. That's the language, yeah. The, um, we were actually talking about being able to open up a, a training, start opening them up towards the community so other people can have the, the same language that the school staff have now. But yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful full day training that goes quite in depth into typical adolescent development, what to expect, how to not pathologize our students. Um, that a lot of what they're going through is typical adolescence. It's growing pains socially, emotionally, internally as you develop those skills intrapersonally and interpersonally. And so it does a nice job at um, also really preparing educators to walk out understanding the bounds and, and the scope of what they can best do to help young people, even if they're not responding to a young person on school campus. Maybe they're at the library and they see somebody or... Uh, maybe they're on the soccer field and they see somebody, how can they respond? Because it really prepares you to respond everywhere, not just in your work setting. And they, um, their reviews have always been really, really highly rating the course, saying I feel much more comfortable um, asking questions about self-harm and suicidality. I feel much more comfortable recognizing that this is typical anxiety and I don't need to pathologize a student or say that they're sick or they're broken or something's wrong with them. I know how to support them so that they can feel... Uh, seen and heard and then connect them to self-help strategies or to a professional in the building or somebody out in the community. And also we have a trauma course that we have that we offer the staff as well. Mm -hmm. 
in order to respond to and be able to recognize and respond to students who have been a victim of trauma. So we've done a lot of things. I think our focus, and I think Sarah also talked about this in her presentation, that we're trying to be proactive and not be so reactive. And so the, the two things that Cindy and Sarah just spoke about are evidence of those type of programs that we're trying to integrate more into um, our instruction within the district. Mr. Haney, did you have a point just on this? Just re real quick, what you were just talking about, training other staff, uh, other communities and stuff, as a parent, I think this would be a great tool to give the parents to understand their adolescent. The adolescents is a, a unique group of people that people have written books about you should lock them up for about three years and let them out when they become <laughs> adults and stuff. But I mean, for parents to understand that, because parents, I think, can create more anxiety in the child. It, 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 my child has got a, you read one psych book and you've got every pathology in the world. We, if we can all remember our first psych 101. So that might be something if we could do, offer to parents uh, a help kit. One of the things that the coalition started in the last two years is we started with a parent advisory board and that parent advisory board in turn has been rolling out this um, parent to parent education evening called Navigating the Teen Years in which there's um, data from the YRBS pulled and discussed, and there's some scenarios, some five or six different difficult scenarios presented to this group of people, and they're asked to come up with <laughs> strategies and share philosophy and strategies about how they would manage specific Great. situations. One of the things I also wanted to say is, you know, talking about building resiliency in youth, when I have the opportunity to talk with young people, one of the things that always surprises me is how much relief they get when they understand that a hallmark of the teen brain is this impulsivity and curiosity, and that making decisions that maybe weren't the best choice once or twice in your life doesn't make you a bad person. It is a, it's a, a, a natural way for a teenager to act. And once, you under, once they understand that they have this innate impulsivity, and that it's within their control to whether they're going to act upon something or not, suddenly they just feel so relieved. It's like, wow, okay, I can do this better next time. You know, I even had one middle schooler who was vaping in a public space in the school, and when I explained this to him, because he said someone handed him the vape, and, you know, he, I said, how did you feel when the person <coughs> handed you the vape? And he said, I felt frightened and curious all at the same time. And I said, that's exactly how a teenager would probably feel. And um, so he said, I'm not a bad kid. And I said, no, you're not a bad kid, you know? So I think that kind of education and outreach to fortify the student's own sense of self, to fortify the parent's communication with their child, to fortify the teacher communication with the student. I think that's what coalition work does, and, and that's why I love being a part of it. It's just, it's a great way of joining, you know, people for a common good, so. Interesting. Um, back at the start of this, uh, we had a, sli uh, a slide on binge drinking, and I'd like to know what the definition within the context of the survey was for binge drinking. Five or more. Oh, it, was it five That's, or more? I thought it was. I could look it up, but it's. I mean, if you're going to talk to us about binge drinking, right. we, we need to know Absolutely. what we're talking about. I, can, I, have yeah. the, <coughs> I have the question, so let me just look it up for you. I have the questions as they were asked of the students. <laughs> Five or more drinks of alcohol in a row, if they were male, within a couple of hours on at least one day during the 30 days before the survey. Okay. Um, is there a sense of how much that's repeated or, uh, to, or a sense of uh, if they do it once, they say, well, no, gee, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> I mean, seriously, um, if, if this is a repeated behavior versus a one-time, oh, my God kind of thing, th th this is really sort of different, and I think the approach we need to take is different, because if, if it's happening rep repeatedly, I think the question is, why would you do something that is so unpleasant at the end? So there were two questions asked. One was the reported current binge drinking, current binge drinking, four or more drinks if you're female and five or more drinks if you're male. 
on at least one day during the past, that's within a couple of hours, mm -hmm. um, on at least one day during the past 30 days. And then we asked the question, it, did you have 10 or more as the largest number of drinks in a row within a couple of hours during the past 30 days? And obviously that percentile was very low. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the one with four or five drinks being male or female was higher. And we, and we hear from our students, it's not scientific, but the majority of our students for years um, have reported that that's the way the American teenager consumes alcohol. And you walk through the parks where they gather and you see, you know, quarts of flavored vodka and things like that. So it's, it seems to be the, the, the way, the American way. I've heard from students, um, exchange students who are just flabbergasted and say, we don't do this in Europe, what's wrong with these kids, you know? So, um, Probably a more per <laughs> permissive attitude towards alcohol in Europe, so it is not this forbidden fruit that they're going to go and overindulge in. I don't know. I'm, I don't I'm not, know. Yeah, but we I'm can, not quite sure. We can ask the Middlesex League about the question. Um, so you're, you're asking, um, do they repeat this behavior? Yeah, how, yeah. how, uh, you know, how uh, often? Yeah. yeah. The thing is, you do a report, oh, oh my God, I did that, versus, oh, I do that regularly. Yeah. There are two different things. I mean, it's sort of like condom use, is if you're being more regular in your activity and you're not using it versus if you've done it once and were, didn't expect to. I mean, the, that repeated nature I, I, really uh, becomes why. Um, not that you should do it at any time, but to, to repeat that kind of behavior. That's, mm -hmm. uh, and on the vaping. Do yeah. we know how they're accessing the equipment and? Yes, so most commonly they're getting it from older siblings or friends, friends, older brothers or sisters, or getting it from the internet. There was a lot of kids, there was a, a group of kids that figured out that they could use the lockers at Whole Foods and Amazon. get on. Yeah. yeah, and deliver, order them on Amazon and then get them delivered there and just pick them up and nobody would even know no packages were coming home. They're, they're very ingenious young people. Um, Have we talked to Whole Foods? That has since stopped. Whole, in fact, whole, the Amazon Primite is not even selling jewels on their website anymore. Mm -hmm. So yeah, another report I heard is that students were going to neighboring communities where there were vape shops and the people were more lax. You know, they never buy anything illicit in their own community because they don't want to bump into a neighbor or anything like that. So they go over the line to other communities um, where the store owners are a little more lax and they buy the materials there. And we have some entrepreneurs who buy in bulk and then go to the middle schoolers and say, hey, you want to you wanna buy this from me? And so there's an entrepreneurial spirit among some of them too, which is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there's any public policy implications <coughs> that we have as a town or is a collection of communities that might help? Yeah, no, well, we, we, mm -hmm. we were one of the first communities to not allow flavored uh, products mm -hmm. to be sold. Um, you have to be over 21 to purchase any vapes. And of course, now with Governor Baker's um, law, all vaping materials have, are supposed to be pulled off store <coughs> shelves. So one would hope yeah. that that will stop some of the newer users. My concern is about the students who've been engaging in this behavior for so long that are, are addicted and really need help. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying to address and support them. All right, Ms. Morgan. Um, I was just looking through this. Am I right to assume that um, in, this, in this set of slides and data that AMS, um, Arlington Middle School, MS, and OMS are all the same groups or are there subgroups? It seems like they're referred <coughs> to I, sometimes they're AMS students, which I assume means yes, so that, Arlington that, Middle School. So they were all grouped. grouped together. Yes, and I apologize. So I had an intern working with me who did some of, she typed some of these up. So yes, I thought okay. I tried to get them all consistent. but So, but whenever we're talking about middle students, middle school students, AMS students, and there at one point, I think on the mental health middle school side, it talks about OMS students, but is that actually? That's Odyssey. Is it just Audison students or Audison and Gibbs? Mm, it would be just, uh, uh, gosh, I don't know. Uh, the pen, the second well, actually, I do know because all middle school, all the data we're from, the, yeah, we're together. So anything that, 
And so Gibbs was lumped in with <coughs> as a middle school school. Okay, and you guys don't have any insight into teasing those out? We do actually. The, the comprehensive report that they sent us did give us a breakdown. So we can look at that. And that, that is where I saw, again, that usage rates were like 0.2% had ever tried marijuana. But again, we had this 30% reporting stress, anxiety, and depression. So that's where you have you know, minimal substance use experimentation, but still <coughs> very high mental health issues. But the middle school, the middle school aggregate qu um, questions are different than the high school questions. Yes. yes. So, because so, Audison students or middle school students reporting school demands and expectations are the source of the most negative stress. We don't have a corollary to the to the AHS question about being under an overwhelming amount of stress. We do. I can pull it. Okay. I just was curious. Like, I'm I'm curious. Like, comparing like same questions at different. I to be groups. honest with you, I think I, I was trying to pull something together that would be very simple and easy to go over in 20 minutes. But if anybody wants a copy of the full report, honestly, um, you know, I'm glad to forward it to you, and it will be made public on a link um, soon. Yeah, I, th I think in do past years we have gotten yeah, the full gotten. report. Okay. So if you could send it to Karen to distribute to sure. us. Sure. I will do no, that. I, I teach statistics, so I'm like, oh, yes, this is good. Like all my stuff. So. Yeah, that's good because <laughs> statistics are a challenge for me. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so, so my other, a couple of things. So we did have a glitch at the Gibbs this year because it was a oh, new yes. school. Yeah. It, was, it was last year. It was a new school. The principal didn't understand the process we're sending it out so the opt-out notice did not go out yes. uh, hopefully mm -hmm. that will be fixed but hopefully you know you all will remember if there's ever a principal transition at any at either Audison or Gibbs or at the high school that that process has to be remembered and done um, the other issue though is that some of the concern particularly was the sexual health questions for sixth graders yes. I understand that the league decided the group decided a few years ago to expand it to the sixth grade. But there definitely was some parental concern with those questions, you know, not being appropriate for sixth graders. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would ask that you go back to the group and, and looking, looking at the statistics, I don't have them, we don't have the breakdown, but if there's only one or two kids at the sixth grade that are sexually active, is it really worth ask, asking all those questions mm -hmm. and making parents uncomfortable and possibly popping up the opt-out rate mm -hmm. uh, with parents? So just something to consider. And then, all of this information is very valuable, and I think um, parents, would, it would be helpful if parents had some sort of communication about this is what we're learning, this is, you know, what we're doing about it, this is what, um, you know, why we're doing this survey to begin with. Uh, so if you could think about, I know resources are always stretched thin, but if you could think about an appropriate parental communication about this, I think that would be, be great as a, as a follow-up. Th I think there was an explanation in the letter to parents as to why we do this and, and how we use the data and how it, how it serves the, the students. As far as the sexuality questions, I know that um, the sixth graders were only asked three <coughs> questions as opposed to high school. They, it, they become less graphic mm -hmm. the younger the child is. Um, and again, in some ways, those are very important because that's where we get the information that, yes, there's a small fraction of students having intercourse, but yet that small fragment, 50% of them, are not using any protection. It's kind of important information. I know that it makes some parents uncomfortable to, to have a sixth grader asked questions about sexual intercourse, but my response to that is the American Academy of Pediatrics indicates that a child's first exposure, unintentional exposure to pornography is at nine years old. So while parents may think their children aren't exposed to any of these thoughts, the reality is probably they are unintentionally and it's really important in some ways to have conversations using proper language and you know medical terminology rather than, you know, stuff they're going to see or stumble across is going to make them uncomfortable and confront and conflate their minds. Oh, certainly, about certainly. Yeah. But, some, but a random <laughs> survey popping up is what I think parents were concerned about. And I think part of the direction we were mentioning earlier we're going to have to start going in is also having conversations about consent, right? So are our young students, because what I have um, 
encountered in, in previous districts too is the question about, there's nothing in those questions about whether or not that sexual activity is consensual. There's nothing in there about whether or not it's something um, that is okay with that young person. Mm -hmm. And there's also no language about, do you know what consent is? Have you, um, have you ever been taught how to say no? Has anyone ever violated that? And we don't ask those questions to be fair at the high school either. And that's absolutely a part that we um, hold responsibility for and that we, we have to introduce into it. So I think it's a direction that might help to frame some of those questions at the younger level as being more developmentally appropriate and can empower parents to understand this is the intention as to why we're asking it. Here's a conversation you can have with your kids to also talk about consent and, and talk about what these questions are asking. Right. So Thank just you to all. your piece, too, sure. the, the number of questions at the high school is much greater than the number of oh, questions yes. at the middle school. Okay. And, and much more graphic. Because you were asking about the <laughs> yes. relationships to the data. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Right, two more things. Um, one is that your own data said that uh, kids were not hearing about condom use as much as some of the other, other districts. So just to you know, think about that, it was about 50% of some of the other districts were higher, much higher numbers. So that, that's what that, No, no, I'm sorry, condom use. Condom okay. use? Okay. That, that's what it looked like. So you were talking about unprotected sex and that it seems like the data is saying that kids aren't hearing about it. Um, At the middle school or high school? I can't remember which. It's the, one of those. The middle school was the 50%. One of those line graphs. Yeah. Oh, you're looking at an image. Okay. Yeah, it was an image. Um, but then I wanted just to ask you, um, I don't, uh, it says high school. 51.7. Some of the other districts are, you know, in 80s, 70s. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So just mm -hmm. it. Um, and I know the Great Body Shop has been undertaught compared to intentions in the mm -hmm. past. So that might be part of what that, Diane. That has, yeah. that has, um, I would say that, uh, well, we have, we didn't, any place we use the Great Body Shop has not, um, and, and students are thinking about the present, um, had been taught in school, um, in Arlington, in Arlington, we do teach it in middle school and high school, at the Audison and at the high school. Mm -hmm. we do oh, teach. I'm just saying that the students are reporting that they're, you know, they're not get, they're not getting enough instruction right. on that compared to other districts. Okay, That's something to watch out for. Mm -hmm. um, my other question, though, is a big quick picture question. So when I mentioned these numbers to my kids, their response is always. Oh, nobody tells the truth in those surveys. They just lie. So I was wondering, and I know that's not true. I know that people tend, you know, I know there's been studies of studies of how, that people actually do report. And I just wonder if you could talk to that issue. We can. So well, first of all, you need to know that we do walk around the buildings while the surveys are being given. And if there is a classroom that's a little bit off or not in total control, we will take those and put those aside. Mm. Um, I know that uh, Colleen and... and and Karen have read through many of the surveys and, and can see when there's some type of so something's classroom off. Classroom that seems off. Something's something. off. Yeah. Something's mm -hmm. off in those classrooms. That, yeah. You know, something like that. Yeah. But due to the consistency over the years, mm -hmm. and that is the biggest part. You know that it's a valid survey. So kids are answering it anonymously. Mm -hmm. They say that, but we know for the most part it is. A valid survey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the evaluators are, you know, statisticians, statisticians and, you know, they're, they sort of know this and all the nuance in it, and they know when to toss out um, a response and, and when it's, you know, not relevant. And I think that's true. I think, I think students often, for their own discomfort, say, oh, you know, I didn't answer it correctly. Mm -hmm. But again, if you even look at our data compared to other regions, we're pretty much all in the same numbers. Nothing's like really skewed. So, um, so yeah, I think that they do, I think a lot of them do answer honestly. One of the things we did this year that I was really pleased about is um, we created a document. So they took the survey and then they were given a link to a document that listed all resources and they were broken down by category. So mental health, um, addiction, you know, sexuality, um, because we felt like these surveys can sometimes be um, Evocative, you know, they can kind of bring up some issues and make some people uncomfortable. So we thought it was, in in a way of showing our appreciation and respect for their 
maturity in giving us this information, we wanted to provide them with some resources that might give them some support. And we'd like to continue doing that, because I think that I feel personally that that's necessary, that you may be opening some wounds, and it's not fair to not provide resources and support. And the counselors are in school, and their resources and support, but it may, those wounds might open when they get home. Yeah. And all in all, you know, I think Arlington fared really, really well. We have a few categories that we can hone in on and, and, and try to figure out what's going on. But, you know, in conclusion, I just think that we looked, our numbers were really good and, and definitely improved in many categories. So I think that that's really encouraging. Okay, one last point from uh, Dr. Allison. <laughs> Sorry, I'm bringing things down. I just, one of the numbers that stood out to me in the whole presentation was the one it, that in the middle school, 8.6% had made a plan for suicide. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is just incredibly scary. It, it's, because it, mm -hmm. it's like beyond um, into a clear danger zone. Mm -hmm. And I'm just hoping, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the full survey. I don't remember all the <laughs> There is some additional information that's sought out about are these people reach, you know, are they aware of the resources? Are they trying to access them? You know, just, mm -hmm. I'd like, you know, are we figuring out what else we can do for these kids? Yeah. It's one of the primary reasons that we have the signs of suicide in place mm -hmm. at the middle school. Um, and Sandy Hook Promise, if, if you're not familiar with Sandy Hook's Promise, it's a, a foundation that was created after the tragedy at Sandy Hook to help build and bolster um, community resources specifically within schools around helping with early identification and supporting students' mental health development and wellness, not just uh, reactionary. And so the signs of suicide is, um, it's a great program, it's, it's evidence-based, all of our kids get exposure to it. Just this week they actually um, rolled out the first of the Sandy Hook programs, which is the, um, it starts with Hello Week. And so you saw all the middle school counselors smiling in front of a big positivity wall, starts to build community and so on. And so the other nice benefit of being fully staffed at the counseling now is that we're able to not just do one lesson of signs of suicide, but we're able to expand it and do fuller and deeper programming. The nice piece about signs of suicide as well is that after the program, all students are um, fill out um, a quick exit ticket that talks about, I need to talk to somebody either about myself or about somebody that I know or somebody I'm worried about, and there's rapid turnaround. All the counselors clear their schedules. They deliver the um, curriculum in a way that they're available to respond to uh, an influx of need that comes from those students, and they're all trained to act, acknowledge, care, and tell, and all the students are trained in ways to see and identify signs of suicide and depression in their peers and their families and to be able to acknowledge it, tell them I care about you, and now we got to go tell somebody who can help us. So. Um, I think there's always room for growth on that, but it, it makes me feel um, reassured that we know there's a need there and we're meeting it directly with specific language and, and programming. Yeah. That's great to hear about. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh boy. We're, I think Arlington is so lucky to have all these invested adults in the community, you know, now with our school resource officer who's going to make and establish relationships with students in the middle school. You just never know what adult is going to connect with a student who may be having some issues. So I just, I think it's, you know, I'm in and out of schools all the time. I have relationships with kids. We all do. So I think that it's a really very positive thing. Um, sure. <laughs> Now that you handed me the data, some other promising news. 13% of our young people in middle school are currently taking medicine, receiving treatment for behavioral health, mental health condition, or emotional problems. So we don't know that that 13% covers that 8.6%, but the fact that 13% of our kids, at least a few of them, are bound to be covered by that, and it's promising to have the, the latter number be larger than the former. So. Well, thank you all very much for you. all this. Thank you. Great suggestion. <laughs> Remember to leave a little bit more time for this uh, discussion I think so, next yeah. time. I think it's an hour. It's an important thank one. You. All right. Thank you, sir. Thanks, thank sir. you. I'll send you a copy of the report and you can distribute it. Great. Thanks. I guess we'll need to know the next steps about distributing this information to parents 
and, and things, so maybe. So our next step, our first step is always with the school committee, and then our next step is with students and parents. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so now we move on to district goals, 2019-2020, the department SMART goals by Dr. McNeil. So the goals that I'm about to share with you are the SMART goals that actually go under the district goals that we talked about in the spring. And um, they're pretty much uh, focused on the curriculum and instruction piece of it. So you'll, look, you'll see in the PowerPoint that I shared with you that they pretty much cover goal objective 1.1. 1 .1. 1.2 and 2.1. And I also kind of hinted to a lot of these district goals that, um, that we've set for this year uh, when I spoke about the various uh, summer activities that, we, um, that took place in the, in the realm of professional development. So instead of going through like every last one of them, because there's quite a few, um, and I, I'm just gonna highlight um, some ones that you know I also talk, talk spoke about this summer, and then I'll try to make sure that I'm I'm covering ones that at the elementary level and the secondary level. So here's goal objective 1.1 is is pretty much focused on uh, curriculum and instruction, and um, I won't read it because it's in the it's uh, stated there. And I did thank you, Dr. Seuss, for you know, point out the fact that in my original uh, PowerPoint that I shared with you in Novus had the prior language in there. And so I've updated the language in this version. So hopefully that's, that made it to Novus. Yes. Did you send us the updated one? It's I think just you have it. the, the grammar. Yeah. I think you have it. Yeah. It's goal objective 1.1 1 .1 where I updated the language. And so you'll see it right there in front of you. Um, and again, it's pretty much talking about the curricula and the curriculum that we've uh, chosen. And in, many, in some of the areas, it's new curriculum, new resources. And so I'll just highlight those areas where we've introduced uh, new um, resources or curriculum. So just going to uh, slide five, I wanna highlight that in grade three at, for this year, 1920 year, the teachers will implement the Lucy Calkins Readers Workshop Units of Study, Building a Reader, Reading Life, and Character Study, which will add to the two that were introduced uh, last year. Um, and so that, the introduction of these Lucy Calkins Units of Study in third grade helped to align our reading instruction from grades one through five. In slide six, um, the th Again, uh, looking at the reading, the ELA, we introduced the book club unit. Um, this was piloted last year, and this will now be adopted in all fifth grade classrooms across the district. And again, this helps with the alignment of reading instruction from in grades one through five. I'm gonna jump now to slide nine. Uh, and we're looking at science um, and in and, and the kindergarten level, uh, we're making sure that, I mean, we're introducing the new tools of the mind, lessons for science, and that will help to align our science instruction with the current tools of the mind curriculum that's currently in kindergarten. And then also a goal in grades one through five, where uh, we'll be using common assessments, and the common assessments will allow us to track progress of how students are responding to instruction and give us an opportunity to evaluate our tools of the mind 
uh, curriculum, our science lessons that we're introducing uh, to align with the tools of the mind curriculum in kindergarten. And then looking at the secondary level uh, in slide 10, uh, we're looking at the computer science. Uh, last year, we had like a multi-age computer science course at the middle school level. Uh, and this year we are, um, they've done some work over the summer to have distinct computer science curriculum for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And uh, that was being introduced this year um, at the middle school level. And I also want to point out that if you look at the slide, you'll see the rationale for each one of the goals, which will provide you kind of the thinking that went into why this goal was selected. Looking at slide 13, staying at the secondary level, looking at the history and social studies, uh, uh, our, the, that department has really looked at reimagining the, re, the research skills and the research paper that uh, secondary students um, are required to do, especially at the high school level. <coughs> and they're in the process. This is actually a two-year goal that they started last year, and they've collected data from students, teachers, and they're trying, and, and now they're implementing um, and uh, updating their instruction to uh, look at specific research skills. Teachers will provide students with the opportunity to practice those that skill as well as to be assessed and given feedback and progress in that skill four times during the year through a common research performance task before the end of the year. So we're looking at how we're uh, teaching research and how we're assessing it at the secondary level. Going, jumping to slide 15, uh, secondary science, uh, looking at the middle school level. Uh, over the last two years, we've uh, updated the science resource that we use for instruction in grades six and seven that are now fully implemented. And this year, the eighth, uh, the eighth grade resource and, and the, the textbook series that we're using is consistent. It's called iScience in sixth, seventh, and eighth. But the eighth grade is piloting various lessons out of the iScience textbook. And we also have the electronic version as well so that students can now um, access it at home without carrying home the heavy uh, textbooks in their book bags. Looking at SEL in slide 19, and this really goes to goal objective 1.2, uh, where we're looking um, at our social emotional um, learning uh, instruction and linking it to our cultural uh, competency uh, instruction. And so Right now, uh, as you know, Sarah, Sarah was here earlier, but she was, but she's, um, and her department is looking at how uh, SEL instruction and practice is being implemented in grades pre-K to second grade. And we're doing it this in chunks. So right now we're looking at pre-K to second, and then next year we'll be looking at it through uh, third through fifth grade at the elementary level. But, um, we're looking to make sure that there's consistency and coherence in the various um, instructional, explicit instruction and curriculum that are being uh, implemented in those particular grades. So we're doing a lot of gathering of data and trying to make sure that we're mapping it out to see where there's an overlap and how it's linking to direct instruction and making sure that it's it, uh, and being embedded in the way that's being implied, applied in the classroom. And then jumping to goal 2.1, we're continuing our focus on cultural literacy. Um, this year, we're going to continue to have our full day professional development day on November 1st, which will provide six hours of training for, for teachers. Uh, on that particular day, we don't have students that will be in attendance. Let me jump to that. There he is right there. So this year, based upon staff feedback, we're gonna have it, uh, a conference style uh, format uh, where we're using uh, staff, uh, Arlington staff, and also I've recruited um, outside facilitators to come in and give uh, various workshops that are going to address the various cultural identifiers that our students um, 
as our students uh, identify as. And so we're, our focus is to provide teachers with concrete strategies and practices that they can go into their classroom the very next day and implement. And the ultimate goal is to make sure that we're providing a safe and welcoming learning environment for all students. And then uh, in order to meet the 10 hours of instruction that we've uh, required for all of our uh, staff, building administrators throughout the year will also have other uh, opportunities for staff to have uh, professional development that will add to the six hours that we're providing on November 1st. So that's just an overview and a highlight of some of the uh, SMART goals that we've written to go along with the district goals that include action steps um, and a way to assess our progress. And uh, you know, I also want to make sure that, we're, that I'm highlighting that they're, you know, they do s fit the SMART goal format. Um, that they're specific and strategic, they're measurable, they're action-oriented, they're rigorous, realistic, and results-focused, and they're timed and tracked. So I'm going to open it up to questions. Uh, Mr. Hainer. First off, thank you for doing the SMART goals. I really appreciate that. And it's really nice. Under goal objective 1.2, um, the second line, the SEL instruction that includes an awareness of cultural bias, did I on the follow-up, the social and emotional learning, you've got that, the SEL part covered really well. Where would the cultural bias aspect come into it in these here? Is there a plan to, to make that an integral part of the curriculum in the K, K2, pre-K2? Oh, so like what we're trying to do, uh, well, with, with that, it's specifically focused on the SEL skills. What we believe is that we have to be, provide this foundation of the five competencies of social emotional learning, and there's a big connection to cultural competence. Uh, so like building relationships, having empathy, things of that nature that we require that in a culturally responsive environment, those are the skills we want the students to have. And they also link to our uh, vision of student as learner and global citizen. So, but we want to provide that basis of social emotional learning and make sure that we're hitting those five competencies that can lead us into those type of culturally responsive instruction. I appreciate that. And you've, you've got far more knowledge than I have in this thing. My concern, when we originally were dealing with the issues of cultural bias, mm -hmm. talking about implementing it in our goals a couple of years ago, my concern it was that it got folded into the SEL, which I have no problem with as long as it's addressed. You're telling me this will be addressed going forward? I will accept that. Well, all staff. So I'm, I'm saying like that specifically is dealing with the SEL piece of it. But all staff, if you saw that the cultural literacy and the 10 hours of instruction right. that we're providing for all staff. I guess it's not so much the staff that I'm concerned with. It's I think the work being done with the staff is is. is it's good and, and it's on the right track. It's getting it into the curriculum part as well. Well, like I said before in my presentation, yeah. that you know, many the what the feedback that I've gotten from staff from prior training is that we want to focus more on those strategies and practices okay. that they can implement into their classroom. So that's a bit fo a big focus this year for our professional development day and with the other parts of that ten hours of instruction that we're mandating that all staff go through throughout the district. So it's not just we're focusing on SEL, we're also focusing on cultural competency, but we're doing that through the professional development. Right. This, you know, we can't, we, we try to write goals that are specific. We, we, we can't write too many goals because then we'll, you know, we'll be all over the place. So we try to deal with the various, you know, like the cultural competency and the SEL in different ways so that you know, we are be, we're able to be, you know, strategic and specific, and we're not trying to um, overburden staff. So we're trying to look, we're trying to make sure that we're doing this in a very strategic manner so that teachers don't feel overwhelmed. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, Dr. Alice Nappy. Hi. Thank you for sharing this with us. My question may verge into something that really, it's sort of related, but it, it comes out of district goals. When I read the list of things that are being done, I felt like I was seeing um, a lot of approaches or initiatives, some new, some have been going on for a while. But what I wasn't 
finding were metrics that looked at is this approach working um, and whether you know, how is it being measured and then did did it achieve what we're trying to achieve with this thing and I can you give feel, me an example um, for the project-based learning um, and again this may belong to a different presentation but it's kind of why are we doing it what and I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing it. I'm just it's sort of why are we doing it what's the measure of success and you know is it student engagement is it deeper knowledge of something is it more independent learning but how are we telling if what we're the reason that we're doing it is we're getting the you know we're getting information another one is the i don't know dibbles d-i-b-e-l-s dibbles dibbles okay um again probably for a different presentation is why are we doing it but the goal is all about making sure the teachers all understand how they teach it but there's nothing about is it achieving the results that are the reason that we started doing it in the first place? And that's really what I'm curious about. Well, Dibbles, and, and is, it may not Dibbles, be a, Dibbles is an assessment. So I, wanna, I, wanna, I, I just want to distinguish what you're saying okay. right there. The Dibbles, Acadians, phoneme segmentation is an assessment. Okay. So they're doing that. They're implementing that in first grade, okay. right? And they're going to use the results in order to inform their instruction. So this is the first year that we'll have it in place. So when you talk about a metrics, I think that at the end, when we look at and get feedback from teachers to see how it has informed their instruction throughout the year, we will be you know, having those type of discussions. So when you, I think that what probably needs to happen, and I've done this, is I've scheduled the curriculum leaders and the coaches to come in throughout the year and then that's where we can have more substantive conversations about the specifics on each one of the goals i didn't want to do that tonight because it would, we have yeah. like so many goals yeah, I, I can't go into every one last one of them i just felt like there should be uh, it seemed to me that in some of the goals there should be it should be getting to the point of getting metrics that look at is the approach working and I didn't really feel that when I was looking at it so that is that is my feedback to you about this and again I realize that some of this may belong correctly belong in a different presentation but anyway uh, Ms. Seuss um, actually I, and I may be wrong with this I think Dibbles is actually a great example because what I understand but as I said I might be wrong is that the reason we're introducing it is that we hope to pick up reading issues earlier that we were not able to pick mm -hmm. up with our previous assessment. Yeah. So then we have a nice, so then we have a nice, here's a problem, here's the strategy we're using to try to solve it. Success looks like we have now mm -hmm. picked up some reading issues among students that we were not able to pick up before. So we have, we just sort of are able to identify th problems earlier than we were. So then we have a nice sort of smart. Tip that's up. part of it, but that's not the whole end okay. of it. Okay. The, the, we do have a battery of assessments that we give to first graders as part of our formal assessment periods. However, we are starting to really assess or evaluate the, in, the information that we're getting. Mm -hmm. So I think Dibbles was, we selected Dibbles because we've done some work around phonemic awareness. And we're saying that that's a, made, that's a piece of information that we weren't getting. So right. we were so we working with if there's an issue that we might not have picked up before because we weren't doing that kind of assessment. Does that seem right? Oh, go ahead, Mary. So, sure. So, as a reading specialist in the district who works with students in first grade amongst other grades, um, traditionally we've relied really heavily on the DRA, the developmental reading assessment, and so it gives you a really good measure in terms of a leveled reader for yep. students, but it doesn't really give you a good measure of the foundational skills that go into reading that then allow you to to um, intervene in a more um, impactful way with students. So Dibbles actually gives us a really quick dipstick um, on a regular basis in terms of monitoring phonological awareness, letter sound ID, nonsense word decoding. So different aspects of reading that are really important on a foundational level that allows us to intervene in a more um, impactful way than we were able to before. Before we just had a general level for students and now we have a better sense of what the deficits might be and how to intervene more effectively mm -hmm. with them. 
So I think that was the reason why we're moving more towards dibbles than, yep. than other Absolutely. measures. So that, again, we're talking about information that we weren't getting before. So we're evaluating. And I think that the work that we've done around the data bank, which is a, co a data collection tool, has really focused our conversation about, okay, this is the data that we're collecting, but is this what we want to put into the data bank to give access to teachers that's really going to inform their instruction? And so that's where I think these conversations have come in, and also our work with uh, Melissa Orkin, mm -hmm. who, was, who was coming to and worked as a consultant within the district. I think Dr. Allison and Faith points just so it would be helpful to see in the goals we know what we're trying to do, what we think success looks like. And, and that actually seemed like a really good example where we could do that with, you know, just restructuring the language around how we were writing those goals. Um, I, I want to say I'm, I'm, you know, goals are always frustrating um, because um, as a snapshot of what we're doing in the district, I think these do a really nice job. Um, but as a outward facing document where we say, you know, here's what we hope to accomplish over the years, or, you know, um, here's where our energy is focused, um, here's our, our, our bigger goals. I think it sort of obscures that. It's hard to, hard to see that through, through the trees. Well, I, I think that we have to, maybe, then maybe we have to have a conversation about what information you're trying to get out of the goal, mm -hmm. because doing this absent, like a presentation, right. you're not going to get everything that you want to learn about all the actions and the things that we're doing from this particular language that we have in the SMART goal, that's going to take, like I said before, us having people come in throughout the year to give a progress on the goal. And then that's where you can say, okay, here's an example of where it's worked, right. and this is the feedback that we've gotten. Because I think that the, the goals that we're writing is just, like you said, it's gonna let you know like what direction we're heading in, but in order to give them more comprehensive information, and maybe you can write down the questions that you would like to have answered and well, provide them with me. I can give you a specific thing so that I mentioned last time. So um, I continue to feel, and I, other people might not feel similarly, um, that saying something like, we are trying to align with the standards is, you know, it feels like weird to present as a goal because that feels like that should be a given or baseline or something that's not, you know, our vision of the, as a district, you know, for all we're trying to do is align with the standards. We're not, you know, that's not a great vision for our district. Um, but but it is. But I mean, obviously, we're spending time doing that. So as a as a as a document of how are our staff spending their time, you know, the fact that a lot of times we're trying to align ourselves with the with the standards is is an important document of how we're spending our time. But as a vision of what we want Arlington to become, it just doesn't you know, it feels pretty low. <laughs> well, like I said, if you write down questions that you would like to have answered, when those individuals come in, I can make sure that those questions are being addressed. But if you look at the language of the goal, it says teachers will implement the new devils, Acadians, phoneme, segmentation, fluency, and nonsense word, fluency assessments in 2019 and 2020. The new assessment is a nationally normed assessment that will provide a different additional information not available using the current assessments that teachers have been using to target their reading instruction. Teachers will follow the administration guidelines of Dibble's Acadians. So I think that it's letting you know right now that we've selected this because it's a nationally normed assessment and it's giving us additional information. So maybe you can write down some specific questions that will help to give us guidance as to how we can change the language in order to fit what you're looking for. Okay. Because to say that globally, it doesn't really give me exactly what you think is missing. Uh, and it also would be helpful, like, after you look at the document, that if you do have questions, if you do put them in writing, I can take it back to the literacy team, and we can work to construct the language and change the language if needed. Ms. Morgan? Um, so I guess uh, what I also would like to see is you know, I see the words implement and roll out and produce, and which is good, but I also want to see, so we're at the, so I'm very interested in what we're doing with Dibbles in first grade. I guess for me, just starting a new assessment isn't a goal, right? Like what I want to see is 
I don't, and I don't know these things. At the end of first grade or second grade, I am not an expert, so I don't know when it gets real with reading, but at the end of first grade, we have, you know, we currently have 80% of kids reading at benchmark. We expect to be able to get to 90% or 85%. I don't know, right? But I can't, I could look, I can look at this and I can't evaluate, I have no capacity to evaluate really on, on any of these goals, right? So um, if I look at secondary SEL, high school collaborative problem solving, they're gonna do a rollout of collaborative problem solving training, okay? So we're gonna do the training, but then what are we hoping to achieve? Is the next time these the people come in to talk to us about the survey that they talked to us about tonight, which I assume is in two years time, are we gonna see fewer kids being bringing weapons to school and like getting into fights? I mean, I don't know, but that would be great if that's what if we you know if we could see that is that what is the, are those the the are these the these are the levers right what what we have here are the levers that are being pulled which is great but I don't understand and this is partially me but it's partially lacking here I don't know what needle we're moving does that make sense? Like I see the levers being pulled. I see the rollouts and the implementation and the really, really important work, but I don't understand how it correlates to the needle we're trying to move. What, what are we trying to push? Like we need more kids to read, right? I presume, otherwise we're not doing this, right? So we, we want more kids to read. I don't know when they need to be reading by. Are they supposed to be reading by the end of first grade? Are we interested in their ELA MCAS scores in third grade? I don't, I don't know. And so it makes it really hard to feel um, connected to the, the work because the work is here. The work is being done. We, I just don't get what we're, what, what, um, what results we're trying to achieve. Does that make sense? A it little does. bit you, like- well, It sounds like you want a greater context for why the goal was written. You want to say like, here's the benchmark. This is where we're starting at. And this is why we're writing the goal. And this is what we're looking to achieve after the goal, after this particular action has been in place. Right, and I know that it's not going to happen in a year. Right. I mean, we're not going to see you're not going to do a rollout of collaborative problem solving training and all of a sudden we're going to drop. I mean, we, you know what I mean? Like, so I, I get that it's not these are not like these are, are are big levers that are being pulled and they don't get you know, it might not happen in a year. But I guess, yes, that's that's what I for me would be really helpful. Well, I think that part, part of the goal sometimes is just the implementation of that particular program. So for at the high school level. Getting, the, getting all the staff trained in collaborative problem solving is the goal for this year. And I think that moving forward, then we can start talking about how it's going to impact what the, what the, the results are going to be. Mr. Schmidt? Okay, I, I have an advantage being an educator. So, you know, if you're implementing Dibbles, I sort of get a sense of why you're doing it. Uh, the, the issue I have in this context is uh, who's your audience and why are you telling us this? So that if, if you're coming to the committee, I mean, we're making global decisions. We're making budgetary decisions. We're making strategic decisions. We're, we, we have the, the big, big levers. You have the implementation level what levers. Yeah. What is the purpose of having this conversation with us to the point is, does it circle back to something that for us is actionable? Is there going to be some decision or something we need to think about in a month, three months, budget season, whenever, that is going to tie to this? Or are we just saying, okay, we're changing the assessment. This is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. We expect to have it done uh, by June or by uh, November. Everybody be trained and everybody's happy and life goes on. What are, why, why do we want to know about this and what would be the desired a a outcome? So think about it as a lesson plan. At, at the end of the lesson, what do you want us to know and what do you want us to do? And, and I'd say that tightening it to the point where we're walking out the door, taking something away is really the beneficial step. If we want to get into the weeds, I think we should do that in subcommittee. 
So again, I mean, I, I think it would be helpful if you could put some of these into like questions into writing mm -hmm. so that I can take them back and give them to the curriculum leaders and we can use this, these as focus questions. So what I hear you saying is that you wanna know why the goals were created, the greater context. You wanna know where we're starting with like, with certain, part, you wanna know, here's the reason why, here's the data we've collected that led us to select, to select this goal mm -hmm. and then this is the outcomes that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so that's why I hear you saying. And to raise it to a, a tiered level, here's a document of what we're doing, life goes on. This is what it's important for us to talk about and say at a meeting and for us to respond to and think about and take away and have in our heads and our hearts uh, a month, two months, three months, six down, months down the road because at some point we may need to make a decision or we may need to be listening to something coming from the community and those are the things that as a committee are the most important to us. Mm -hmm. oh, Mr. Thillon? Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so um, I think as, so I'm just, as a general kind of uh, thought for when people come before the committee uh, to talk about these goals, I think you can tell them in advance. <clears throat> we don't need to have a specific, we don't have to send, send questions for each one, but specifically I think what would be helpful is um, what is the data set that, that promoted <clears throat> or that, that prompted the group to pick this goal and where do you want to be at the end of a year or three years or five years? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think in, um, uh, sometimes in, uh, you know, all sorts of organizations, uh, school districts, school, individual schools, uh, companies, nonprofits, you think in terms of measurable outcomes over a multi-year period. That's part of the problem with this goal process that we have in Arlington is that it's, it's really hard to have a really anything <laughs> at the end of the year other than the teachers did the, the workshop mm -hmm. or the students started using the new mm -hmm. materials. So I think it's kind of like what would be helpful to us is <clears throat> where do you want the students to be? Where are they now, data-wise? And where do you want the students to be X number of years from now? And I'm not even, and you know, I'm not even sure how you measure, I mean, I'm not sure what number of years you guys have to figure that out. But I think as a general rule, that's the best way to approach any presentation of the committee on these goals. Mm -hmm. That would be, I think that would be helpful to everybody here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, so I, I want to actually congratulate you for mm -hmm. putting all this together. I mean, I think we often hear from the curriculum leaders in their individual presentations what, what they've done during the year or what they're working on. So it's nice to see it all in one document like this. This is good information for us to have. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think what people are talking about sort of goes back to the discussion we had with the five-year plan and what the goals were going to be for what are we going to do with all this money? How are we going to show that we use the money wisely? We still don't really have that. I mean, so we did talk about uh, uh, third grade reading level, and actually Dibbles, the Dibbles ties really well into that because that was the one goal that we did put in the five-year plan, and presumably the Dibbles will help with that, right? So that's that's all tied together. Some of this other stuff probably has other stuff. Some of it, some of it might not. Some of it might just be a small curriculum change that really, you know, just we're keeping up with the standards. We have to keep up with the standards. We don't really necessarily. Um, predict an outcome change, but we have to keep up with the standards, and you're showing us that you're keeping up with the standards, which is good, but that's not as important as sort of the bigger strategic goals of improving reading level for grade three or improving our science knowledge, you know, by the six, sixth grade uh, MCAS or whatever, whenever it is, um, whatever those big goals are. So, so this is a good first step, but I think you're hearing that there's probably a little bit more work that needs to be done as, to, as far as these more outcome, multi-year based goals as, as an administration, not just as a yearly thing. Um, it, it's, a, it's a lot more work and a more culture change, but it's something I think we want, a direction we would like to head into, maybe working with CIA subcommittee mm -hmm. on that more, um, but this is certainly a good start. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right, great. So we were going to have a facility update, but um, uh, Mr. Mason is not feeling well. So that's in Novus. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that we need to have him go over it. Um, if anybody has any questions, we can ask him next time. Um, the next item then would be enrollment projections. Um, Mr. Hayner had asked me to put this on 
the agenda to discuss a little bit um, where different committees might do work with regard to enrollment issues, particularly at the elementary schools. So we know that some of our elementary schools are too full. Um, we don't quite know how many students to expect in the next few years. We've had, um, nobody's here to address it, but Mr. Mason and Dr. Bodie had tried to get um, some quotes on consultants that could help us with enrollment projections that never really went anywhere. I think we need to get more information from them as to whether we should rebid those, rebid that process, or or maybe just go with that one consultant that did respond. So that something is better than nothing. Um, so I, we did dis discuss a little bit of budget this morning. It seems like budget, which deals with numbers, is the logical subcommittee to drive that process as far as getting better enrollment numbers to the extent we can. Mr. Thielman? Well, my suggestion would be that um, if the budget committee, sub subcommittee determines that the enrollment trends are uh, concerning enough for impact of space, then I think we should probably start to have a conversation with other people in town about restarting the school enrollment task force, mm -hmm. which was a, a real, a, it was a committee that included people from, you know, capital planning and finance and select board and uh, school committee superintendent, town manager. And so that group, I, I served on it, Cindy, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Cindy did. Um, and so um, we had a bunch of people on that committee and we met for a couple of years and that led to Hardy expansion, Thompson expansion, uh, Otteson, I mean, yeah. uh, Gibbs rebuild. I'm not saying we want to do all that stuff. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I'm not saying that. I don't want anyone to <laughs> hear that right now. But I, I do think that um, we, the group should, if it's serious enough, yeah, the group should meet. Yeah. So I think that's that's eventuality. What might might happen if it's serious enough? But first, we have to figure out, you know, what is what are the numbers going to look like? Yeah. How many? And then the facilities can look at. Well, where, where, are we, where do we have space? We, ha we added space at the Hardy, yep. and we're not using all of it. So, you know, can we use that in a, can we use that space? If we use that space, then, then you know, are the other schools okay? Or are they not? You know, we, we, we don't know. So yes, that, I, I, I would just say. We definitely it. have to do all that groundwork, I think, first before, we, and unfortunately we've already started the conversation a little bit about modulars. Yeah. But we, we, I think we need to have that, use this year to sort of do that groundwork. Um, there isn't a crisis yet. I mean, Brackett has, has some issues, but there isn't a crisis yet. We were, you know, so I think we do have some time, but that, that definitely would be Good point. down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just to clarify. Yeah. Um, uh, several, I don't know, whenever we did this, I don't know, I can't remember the year. Whenever, whenever we did this the last time, we basically had a conversation inside the school committee and inside yeah. the school district, and then we realized we, get, we have nowhere to go. Yeah. And then it went out of yeah. the school. So I don't think, I'm not advocating yes. yeah. that yeah. it leave the day. Right, this right. table yet. or yeah. leave the school committee or leave the school district conversation yet but I think it's the budget committee's yeah. uh, subcommittee's job to figure out if it should mm -hmm. okay. and to provide the data yeah. to determine whether it should Mr. Just Hainer. a clarification the budget committee will be responsible for looking at the numbers yeah, yeah. facilities will be take the responsibility to look at the current facilities that we have and make a determination of what is or is not available. Do we have? Do we need? Do we have enough room? Yeah, exactly. And community right. relations you, right. is going to deal with redistricting potential but, buffers. But yeah. <laughs> they come, yeah. Yes. To the extent that we can mm -hmm. ameliorate some of the issues at certain schools by buffer zones, and right. that you know, yeah, that's yeah. another. But right now, we we. I mean, Thank you. other than putting the placeholder in place for the whatever the placeholder for the uh, the modular, mm -hmm. we don't have a crisis. Mm -hmm. We're not sure. We don't have enough information to make a determination. Right. right. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Yes. Dr. So Allison, happy? Budget is happy to take this up. Um, <coughs> I guess the question. Is, so, I think the first thing to do will be to sit down with the administration and, yeah. and look to them for a plan. Um, and I'm just telling you all that that's that's going to be the approach. Do we need to have a motion to put this on, or do, is is it just you know it's been said and accepted? Yeah, I don't think so. I think okay. it's yeah. Okay, that's fine. I, I would just ask that that this has to be done as soon as possible. Yeah. You're aware of it. Yeah. But although we don't have a crisis, there are people are concerned because right. we discussed that thing about modular units. Yeah. More information is better than none. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, 
point but out, we've had parents come to us last year and this year asking for modulars in schools, and, and we need to have some data mm -hmm. to start talking. So it's not, this is not new and different where mm -hmm. we need to yep. address. Mm -hmm. Did you have any? Yeah, I, 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 I have to tell you that I was impressed with the demographer report that we had, uh, what, six years ago now? It was mm -hmm. like around 2012. Uh, played out pretty well, but uh, it's it's very stale. Mm -hmm. um, we, we were pointing in the right direction, but every year you go past the initial set of assumptions, mm -hmm. it unravels a little more and a little more. And I think that the, the, we, we were pointing towards trends, but, you know, uh, we, we're past the point where it's useful. Yep. Uh, and, and these things are really imperfect beasts. The ones that are free and cheap are not really worth what we pay for them. And if we, and I, and I see us still looking at it increases in various parts of the community and knowing the sales patterns and where the homes that are likely to turn over are mm -hmm. and all those elements that went into to the methodology for doing the demographic report I think are important to understand all over again because mm -hmm. the town's very different now than it was in 2012. Yeah. My memory is the presenter was very very impressed with his presentation. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, he was. He, he had a good time. He had a good time. Yeah. Very impressed with everything he said and the way he said it. Yeah, he, he, yeah, he, yeah. he was having fun. Yeah, yeah. Very impressed All with right. himself. But, but it was really an interesting methodology yeah, yeah. that I appreciated watching. I wish I had that level of self-confidence. If, we, if yeah. we could see the methodology, it would be nice. All time. right, superintendent's Hold report. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Dr. McNeil is doing it tonight. Yes, so uh, I just have a couple of things that I'd like to highlight. Um, in this recent, our recent town day, <coughs> I'd like to highlight our uh, jazz band director, Sabatino Tino D'Agostino, mm -hmm. and the jazz band came and they performed. And I'd also like to highlight the Magical Singers, which was who were conducted by our new Arlington uh, High School's choral director. Um, and I didn't write down her name. Uh, and her name is Mar Mara Walker. So our new, the new high school's uh, choral director, Mara Walker, I'd like to highlight the magical singers for their town day performance. Uh, looking at athletics, I have an updated report from our new athletic director, John Bowler. Um, I will have asked him also to come in uh, in order to introduce himself to the community. But some of the bullet points that he shared with me is that in, our, in, in regards to our new fall sports, we have over 459 student athletes participating in 10 different sports. Um, cross country, which is a non-cut sport, has 138 athletes, uh, 76 uh, girls and 62 boys. Soccer, which is a cut sport, has 132 athletes, which are girls, uh, 63 girls and 69 boys. And these are two, our, two of our biggest sports by enrollment this fall, cross country and soccer. Uh, we have two new varsity coaches this fall. We have Rob DiLoretto, um, who was one of the deans in the high school, is our football coach, head coach, and Don Hirsch is the golf head coach. Uh, at the first football game, we had over 300 students attend, uh, in which they showed a lot of positive uh, school spirit. And our next week, we will have our, the, their pep rally which is scheduled for actually in a couple of weeks. And next week, they're gonna, they're gonna start the captain council. And then in a couple of weeks, they're gonna have their first pep rally on October 22nd. Uh, I'd like to highlight Bill Barrett, who retired as a golf coach this past July. He was the golf coach at Arlington High School since 1977. So we'd like to thank him for his service. Um, the John Bowler also let me know that they, there's, there's going to be a blog on the school website that he's going to update each week and with the results from the various uh, games and competitions and a list of all the home games for the upcoming week and the blog is also linked to the school's Facebook and Twitter accounts. I'd like to highlight also that uh, during this past couple of weeks, we've had a lot of our curriculum nights and back to school nights. Uh, tonight, we had four. We had Brackett Elementary, Dallin, 
Hardy, and Pierce. Most of the curriculum nights and back to school nights have already taken place. The only one that still needs to happen is Monotomy Preschool, which happens on October 3rd. And that, include, that concludes the uh, superintendent's report. Great, thank you. Now, uh, subcommittee and there's no policies. Uh, subcommittee and liaison reports and announcements. Uh, budget. Consent. 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 consent oh, sorry. 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 Uh, the consent agenda, yes. All items listed below are considered routine. It will be enacted by one motion. No separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant number 20049, dated 91719, in the amount of 719397.58. Approval of minutes, June 13th, 2019, and September 12th, 2019, regular meeting minutes, and no trip. So moved. Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Right, yes. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Unanimous. All right, now subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, so Dr. Allison Ampey. Budget met this morning. Um, we, um, because Mr. Mason was ill, um, we couldn't get really deep into much, but we've, dis we've begun discussing calendar um, and the budget. We're looking to <coughs> potentially change the budget uh, reporting dates and instead of monthly um, we're talking about maybe every other month um, and also we're going to be looking at what sort of information people want to get from the budget reports so if any of you folks have ideas send them on to, I mean who's not on budget send them on to us um, but we have to have some more meetings with the actually with the administration present to make some more progress great thank you Policies and procedures. Mr. Quinn. Uh, no report. Uh, CIAA. No report. Uh, community relations. Ms. Seuss. Uh, we need to have a meeting. Uh, we have five applicants for a transportation advisory committee. Um, I thought we'd find our availability and then see who can make it and maybe call in if they can't be in person. Um, I also want to throw out something. Um, uh, I haven't talked about this specific um, proposal, so you feel free to throw it back. Um, but we did generally talk about having fewer um, uh, school committee chats, and I think last year we talked about maybe two. I'd like to propose three for the year, um, so, which would make, so, so that we could have two at each, total of six people, the chair would be, wouldn't, wouldn't uh, meet then. Um, uh, November, February, and May, and I was wondering what people thought of that. It's worth a try. <coughs> I'm not opposed. Yeah, okay. <coughs> um, basically, a problem for the public is that um, we love the idea of chats. We want to hear from the community, but we found that we people weren't necessarily showing up, and so maybe if we have fewer of them, um, that there might be greater attendance at them. That, that was sort of the working hypothesis. Great. Okay, good. All right, that. thank you. Uh, facilities, Mr. Hainer. Uh, we met on the 18th uh, to discuss uh, the approach for the new year. Uh, we're going to do a f regular um, facility subcommittee meetings will be scheduled to address items such as space capacity and other things of that nature. The other part was uh, that we're, we're going to schedule information meetings with each building PTO to present what has been accomplished, what is going on, and what will be accomplished. This. Uh, Report this information will be prepared uh, by the superintendent, CFO, and facilities director to be presented by a subcommittee member. Any feedback during the meeting would be noted and passed on to the CFO. The first meeting will be held at the Hardy PTO meeting on October 16th. Great, thank you. Uh, legal services? Nothing, nothing at this time. Uh, Arlington High School Building Committee. We meet next on uh, Tuesday at 6 o'clock uh, in this room. Uh, the calendar committee. Uh, we haven't. We don't have another meeting yet. Okay. Um, I need to push to have that done. Election modernization committee. Oh, uh, I accidentally missed the last one. No, no problem. <laughs> That's okay. You be, I actually I have them. I've been looking over the anyway, minutes. I know, but right, yes, yeah. I'm sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> superintendent search process. Right. 
Uh, we, we're going to schedule a meeting uh, as soon as we get a get it together. I've requested uh, some sample Great. RFPs uh, that other districts have used in terms of soliciting, so we can look at them as a template. Uh, Mr. Hainer's provided some documentation from a prior search, uh, and we'll just get started. Great. Uh, there's nothing on negotiations yet. Are there any liaison reports or announcements? Nothing. Uh, I saw our former colleague Judd, Keir, Judd Pierce oh, do an outstanding job in oh. uh, in uh, race. Yeah, oh, yes. nice. going Saturday. So. It is. Uh, he, he's. It's a great show. Yeah, we have tickets too. It is a great show. Yeah. It is fantastic. Great. Uh, any future agenda items? Nothing. Sorry. I might want to just mention again that. The schools are closed on Monday. Sure, yes, that's a good point. Okay. Yeah. So no school on September no school on 30th. Monday, uh, September 30th. Yeah. Right. Mr. Hainer. <coughs> Your agenda item, um, we talked about uh, up updating on a regular basis uh, what's going on with the issues on the high school early start. Um, I realize part of that's negotiations. You just addressed that. But the other part is uh, dealing with the METCO issue. So I don't know whether we're going to do it on a monthly basis, uh, but just to keep us informed of what's going on. Thank you. All right. I will note that for some future agenda. Mr. Sigman. Uh, we need to put the uh, delegate assembly uh, yes, I on do the agenda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Anything else? There's no executive session. So can I get a motion, motion to adjourn? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed or abstentions? All right, unanimous. <laughs>